State your name for the ladies and gentlemen of this jury. Leon, Leon Jacob. And Mr. Jacob, uh, you're the defendant in this case, are you not? I am. And you realize you're charged with solicitation of capital murder? Yes, I do. And uh, I have been representing you for how many months, do you know? Approximately one year. Okay. Um, Mr. Jacob, uh, give the give your background to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. What, uh, for instance, um, we've heard that you are a doctor. My educational background, as you're asking? Yes. Um, I attended Phillips Exeter Academy for high school in New Hampshire. I went to the University of Texas uh, in Austin for college. I attended St. George's Medical School, um, and that's, I got my medical degree. In 2005, I graduated. You're going to have to speak up a little louder so that we can all hear you. I graduated medical school in 2005. From where? From St. George's Medical School. And where is that located? It's located, it's a conglomerate between the British UK and the United States. It's, it's part of the education takes place in Grenada and the rest of it took place in New York City. And uh, have you practiced medicine? Yes. And what, what area have you practiced? I was a general surgery resident for a total of four years in and out of uh, my training. Um, I did two transplant fellowships, one in um, left ventricular assist devices uh, and heart transplantation at St. Uh, St. Luke's uh, Texas Heart here in Houston, and I did another fellowship in um, kidney and uh, pancreas transplantation at the University of Texas uh, Houston as well. You've heard uh, some testimony during the course of this case that uh, you were in the military. Have you not? I've heard that, yes. Were you? No. You've heard some testimony that uh, you had indicated that you had been down to Guantanamo uh, and assisted individuals that had been um, wounded uh, so that they could be rehabilitated for the purposes of, uh, of uh, being tortured and giving testimony or giving evidence. You've heard that. Those statements were recorded, yes. All right. Are those statements true or not true? No. Uh, the statements that uh, you are attributed to making, um, did you in fact make those statements? You heard them on the tapes, yes. I made them to the police officer. All right. And what was the purpose of you making those grandiose statements? I think at the time, given the fact that the two of us had been drinking uh, together and the fact that he was talking very much about how he kills people for a living or he intimidates people, and then when I saw his gun, um, it, I became very fearful and I think it was more bravado than anything else, trying to bolster myself up uh, with him. Uh, I'm not accustomed to being around firearms. I don't own one, never have. Um, and uh, when he lifted his shirt up, I think that really upset me a great deal. Um, and I was trying to sort of play a, a part equal to his, if you will. Um, that's about the best I can explain it. Okay. Now, um have you been married before? I have. And do you have children? I do. How old are the kids? Uh, my oldest son, James, uh, turns nine next month, so he's still eight. And my uh, youngest son, Cash, uh, he is five and a half. He'll turn six uh, in July. Do you see the children? Uh, prior to my incarceration, I saw them uh, very often, about once every two or three weeks. All right. And yeah. I also face time with them, you know, four to five days a week uh, in the evenings for, you know, varying lengths of time, depending on what their attention span was. 
What was the name of your ex-wife? Her name uh, was Annie Jacob. Now it's Annie Morrison. All right. Annie Morrison? Yes, sir. And uh, who, who was Valerie McDaniel? Well, to me or just in general? No, well, let's talk about it in general. Uh, Valerie McDaniel was a, uh, a woman who uh, was a veterinarian, and um, my girlfriend uh, or common law wife, I guess, if we qualified for that, uh, right. towards the end of her death, she uh, was a lot of things. I, I don't really sure what you're asking. All right. Well, uh, to you personally, you were together romantically, correct? Yes. Uh, for how long a period of time? Um, we lived together for about three or two and a half months, uh, but we had been romantically involved for quite some time, uh, more than that. How much time, approximately? Um, probably a couple of years. Now, um, can I re retract my last statement? It was not a continuous uh, relationship. We had had an interlude uh, in 2014, and then there was a long break where we were just friends. And then, you know, after um, I broke up with my former girlfriend, we rekindled the romantic rela part of the relationship. And your former girlfriend was whom? Uh, a woman by the name of Megan Louise Barakis. All right. And you've heard Megan testify in this court? I have. All right. Now, uh, tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about your relationship with Megan. When did you start? We met. Um, during my divorce proceedings, I lived in a couple of hotels in Pittsburgh. I lived in the Wyndham Grand for quite some time, and I decided to move hotels, and I was given a referral uh, to a place called the Cambria Suites, uh, which was right next to the console center where the penguins play, and it, I checked in there, um, I think, in the beginning of uh, 2014, sometime in early January, and I met Megan there. Okay. And uh, tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about uh, Mac McDaniel. Had you ever met him? I met him a couple of times uh, when he lived next door to my mother. Uh, I think once when I came down to visit, and then once when I moved down here, I stayed with my mother for, I, moved, I re moved back to, um, to Houston in 2014. I, I stayed with my mother for a couple of weeks, uh, maybe three or four weeks actually, more like a month. And um, I had run into him a couple of times on the street. No real interactions, just a friendly, high neighbor, you know, kind of thing. So you didn't socialize with him? Absolutely not. And you didn't uh, uh, go to his employment or vice versa? No, I was, uh, I knew nothing about him. I'm at sorry? The, at the time, I knew nothing about him except for he was supposedly um, Valerie's husband, although he was seemed to never be around very much. Um, the few times I did see him, he drove into the house and would leave shortly thereafter. And uh, was he married at the time? To Valerie, yes. Okay. Now, tell the ladies and gentlemen of this jury uh, about the uh, split, the initial split that you had with Megan.
we what I'll, I'll get there um, we had had a, a pretty heated argument uh, the night of January 12th of 2017 um, the argument started over the fact that um, sort of by accident I had discovered that she had been moving money out of our uh, joint checking account for quite some time um, into somewhere else or she was taking cash uh, withdrawals and I confronted her about that and we had a you know a really bad fight I, approximately how much money did you approximately it was several thousand dollars I, I really hadn't discovered a lot at that time because you know it was kind of shocking to me that what was going on I have since after that found you know more but the initial thing that took my attention was there was a five hundred dollar paycheck that she wrote to herself out of our personal account on um, January 5th of uh, 2017 um, subsequently the day I came back from visiting my children in Chicago she picked me up at the airport and you know things seemed fine it's uh, go ahead. Well, well, I'm sorry. I sustained the objection. So yes, I understand. Uh, you indicated that things seemed fine between you and Megan. Yes. You know, we had this fight, but um, I, prior to the fight, I had discovered that she had been taking money out of our joint checking account, and it was you know, quite upsetting that I discovered that. that taking their, those deposits or withdrawals was without your knowledge at the time it happened and without your consent? Yes. It was a joint checking account. She had the right to do that. I have to preface that, the statement with that. But Megan had handled all the, the bills. She was, she was very responsible with paying bills on time and, you know, paying our rent on time. and. Uh, I, I really did not get involved in the finances too much. We both put money into the account, but I sort of was very happy to let her stay out, or for myself to stay out of that. She was very organized when it came to our finances, so you know I trusted her. It was I found out sort of by accident. Question and answer, please. What did you find out by accident? I had put on our home computer and. I, she had been logged into um, our banking account, and when it, I, the screen, I saw the screen. I just clicked on some checks. I don't. I was just looking at the stuff that was on there, and I, I noticed the check that she'd written to herself. It was bizarre. And did you have an argument about that? Yes, that's what the argument precipitated the argument. Yes. All right, and we've heard uh, testimony that she moved out. She left that evening. She left all of her belongings there, um, so I, she didn't move out that night. Um, okay. In fact, I moved all my stuff out about four days later. And did you also move some of her stuff out? No, I left her clothes, you know, anything that she, was hers, I, I left there as far as I didn't touch any of her clothes or any, any of her toiletries or anything. I took my clothing and I took our furniture. Later time, you got back together with her, correct? No, not after January 12th. All right. Now, uh, let's go to the uh, whole allegation of solicitation of capital murder. Okay. Um, you know who the party is that you're accused of soliciting to murder. Are you talking about the undercover officer? Correct. Yes. All right. Now, um, were you a party to conversations with the undercover officer? Yes. And do you know whether or not those record? were you told that they were being recorded? I had no idea they were being recorded at the time I had the conversations with him. When was the first time you had a conversation with the undercover officer? I met him at the Olive Garden on, um, I think it was March 7th of uh, 2017. All right. Tell me about that meeting that's been talked about a lot. Tell me your version of the meeting. Judge, I'm going to object. This calls for a narrative. It does. What's the next, please? What, uh, 
what was the first time at the Olive Garden when you met with the undercover officer? Outside of the restaurant, um, I had Valerie and I had arrived before they did, so we we were sitting by a booth I could see out to the front, and when they arrived, I met them, I think, outside in the front and showed them where we were sitting. Um, I met him either right there or right after he got into the restaurant. What was the purpose of that meeting from your perspective? It was to It was to finalize some plans that I had had with um, somebody I had thought to be a private investigator um, who we called Zach or Abraham, uh, who has been identified in court here as um, Motaz Aziz. Um, he had told Valerie and I that the, some of the things that we had discussed with him that he had become too close to us. Sustain. Sorry. How long did that meeting last? Uh, I don't know, like an hour, hour and a half. Um, I can rephrase my previous answer if you'd like. Sorry. Did you pay for the check or did they pay for the check? Or? I think we picked the tab up, yeah. Okay. Uh, when is the next time you saw the undercover officer? At Valerie and I's apartment. Um, I think the day after uh, the meeting with um, the, the Olive Garden. Okay. Now, there was money they exchanged hands, correct, at some point? At some point, uh, yes, the officer was given some money. And what was the purpose of that? I had received a phone call from the undercover at some point, and I'm not sure that we've heard that phone call here in court today, but he had told me that he needed some expense money. Um, this calls for hearsay. Sustain. Were you of the impression that uh, you needed to give him money for expenses? He had said that, me, sorry, me. I apologize. Um, Just try to listen to the question and answer it if you can. Yes, Your Honor. I was under the impression that he needed money for expenses and he wanted a um, advance on what we had agreed to pay him for some services. And what were the services that you agreed to pay him? I'm not 100% at the time, I was not 100% of what those services were because Valerie had made that negotiation with him. All right. And as a matter of fact, at the time the money was paid, were you present or were you out of the room? I was present, but I did not hand him the money. It was on a it was on the table covered by some laundry. At some point in time, there was a discussion uh, that's been testified to you or by you, not by you, but by the undercover officer uh, about the discussion that he had with Valerie about her ex. Recall that? I do. And did you participate in that discussion? I did not. What did you exactly do to extract yourself from that conversation? I left the table. Um, I was previously, previous to them talking, Valerie had them even coming to the restaurant, Valerie had said she wanted to talk to Aziz and um, the guy we called Adam, we met as Adam by herself. And that she said that when it w she wanted to talk to them that I w she'd ask me to leave the, the restaurant. And did you? I did. Uh, did you actually leave the restaurant or did you just leave the table? And no, I left the, the physical space. I went out to the parking lot. All right. Um, If I may have a moment, Judge. Thank you, 
You've heard some testimony here that you had conversations with uh, the undercover officer Duran about uh, wanting to kill um, um, Megan and McDaniel. That's correct. All right. Uh, tell us your recollection of the content of those conversations, if they in fact occurred. Well, I can't really give you a recollection of something that didn't happen. I never asked anybody to kill anybody. Um, does the word kill, hurt, harm in any way, shape, or form appear in any of those recorded conversations? Not on my behalf. I'm sorry? Except for to exclude them from things I want done. I never asked to have anybody hurt, killed, harmed. Um, kidnapped or I never asked for anybody to be in any way physically hurt did you pay money at all for this purpose no all right. well there was no purpose for me to pay money towards anybody being hurt because I never asked for that now we've heard testimony about there being money that had been um, I believe transmitted to Megan or to the undercover officer. Uh, what was the purpose of giving the money to the undercover officer as far as Megan's concerned? It had nothing to do with Megan um, at all. all right. well, who did it have to deal with? It had to do with an advance payment on what Valerie and the undercover officer had agreed upon because of expenses that he needed to hotel and whatnot in for the time that he was there he had explained to me that um, well, going into your say. it had nothing to do with monies to Megan for her expenses to leave correct no that had been paid um, previously to Aziz and how much money was paid to Aziz? He was given um, initially a $2,500 payment for the initial investigation that I had hired him to do. Um, he was given an additional $5,000 uh, for continued expenses during that investigation. He was given a little over $5,000 for a moving company receipt that he had showed me. Um, did it arrange for Megan's stuff to be moved um, back to Pittsburgh? He had given me a receipt for a Continental Airlines ticket, uh, first class one way that was a little over 700 and change. I gave him a thousand dollars for that, and then he had told me that he thought it was appropriate to give Megan some money to restart her life in Pittsburgh. And I asked him how much, um, and the sum of ten thousand dollars in cash was. Um, agreed upon which he received and the 10,000 went to Aziz as opposed to Megan that was how it was arranged yes I was under the impression that Aziz was uh, in contact with Megan um, on a semi-regular basis well but my question is was the money given to Aziz for Aziz or to be given to Megan it was to be given to Megan the monies that were given to Aziz for Aziz were the initial $2,500 that he received plus the additional $5,000 for what I thought were his services. Do you know if in fact he gave money to Megan for this purpose? I have learned um, in testimony f that we've heard in court that that did not occur. Did what? It did not occur. Do you want me to rephrase my... St I've learned during testimony and during the course of this entire process that um, in fact Aziz had never even spoken to Megan and therefore she never received any of these monies that were supposed to go to her. All right. Um, did you ever pay money to an undercover officer 
uh, for the purpose of harming or hurting either Megan or May Daniel? No. Did you ever discuss that issue with the undercover officer? We had, yes, we had multiple discussions or multiple conversations about not wanting to harm or hurt anybody. And that was something that you had expressed, correct? Repeatedly. All right. And as a matter of fact, the jury's heard testimony where uh, you in a conversation talked about, I don't want anybody hurt, um, I don't want anybody harmed, things of this fashion, correct? Absolutely. In fact, I've read the transcripts. This goes into narration. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I have, in their entirety. In what transcripts uh, are you referring to? Of the audio tapes that were provided uh, well, to you by the prosecution via the police uh, from their undercover investigation. And was there anything uh, on the audio tapes suggesting kill, harm, hurt, Megan or McDaniel? No. In fact, um, 177 times during these, trans these conversations do I say the words, I don't want to harm, or hurt, or kill anybody. Okay. How did you get uh, into a relationship with Motaz? I received a phone call from him um, sometime in late January or early February of uh, 2017. And what was the content of that phone call? Sustain. What did you tell Motaz uh, during the conversation? I told him that I would appreciate to meet with him. Um, he had details of what had been going on from a woman named Laura Thurlow and um, she had told me that he was going to call me and he did. And Laura Thurlow testified in this court a couple of days ago, right? Yes, sir. And um, during the course of your relationship with Laura Thurlow, um, did you hear any testimony about um, Megan being placed in a car under sedation um, by way of uh, some type of a needle that you would provide? I did. And uh, did you hear her testify that, that the purpose of that was for you to be able to get control of the situation uh, so that you could be with Megan. I did, but I deny ever making those suggestions to Laura Thurlow. You deny what? Ever making those suggestions to Laura Thurlow. Suggestion relating to the syringe? Absolutely. And suggestions uh, relating to you uh, wanting to be back in touch with, uh, or back as a couple with Megan? I do not deny those suggestions. You do not deny them? No, but I deny the suggestion that I ever asked Laura Thurlow to somehow inject Megan Varicus with a needle to sedate her. Um, in fact, those were suggestions from Laura Thurlow to me, and I was very emphatic that I did not want that to happen. All right. Uh, your feelings about Megan. Uh, you love her? I did. Okay. Did you love her through this period of time that you've heard testimony about? Uh, uh, 
about, you know, uh, having her and McDaniel uh, killed? It's a difficult question to answer. I think that when you give your heart to somebody for such a long time, that part of you always still loves them. You know, when we broke up, it was, you know, fairly volatile breakup and a surprise to me. Um, and after some time, I realized that she was, there was no getting back with her. And I think that, um, you know, I had to accept that. But you tried. I did try to get back with her, yes. You see, you've seen these emails. Absolutely. And the emails all consist of your love for her. They do. And your desire to get back together again. They do. Did she respond to that? Um, not so much. Just asked me to sort of leave her alone. Um, Why did you leave her alone? In hindsight, I, you know, probably should have, but I just didn't understand how you could become so entwined in someone's life and um, just walk away so easily uh, from their life, especially considering we were really happy. Um, I know that she testified. Uh, That it had been a long time come. Yeah, it's awfully broad. I'm she sorry. Just, it's awfully broad question. She testified to a whole lot of things. So yes. if you want to be specific, then yeah. Uh, you did you? Uh, what was my last question? Is there a particular reason why you would not leave her alone? I think it was a multitude of reasons. I can't put it to, into one reason. Would you categorize your position as being desperate for her? I could characterize it that way. I think to answer your previous question, um, I thought that she really loved me the way that she said she did, and I uh, couldn't imagine ever walking away from her the way she walked away from me, just like that. Uh, any further questions at this time? Michael Kubosh. Yes, sir. Uh, did you ever visit his office. I did. And what was the purpose of that visit? To have a discussion with him about a man that I had come to know is the name Zach, who has been identified in court as Motaz Aziz. All right. And why did you want to have discussions with with uh, Kubosh about that about Zach? I was under the impression that if Motaz Aziz ever disappeared or could not be reached that Michael Kubosh would be able to find, would know where he was. And why did you need Zach? He was already actively uh, trying, he was already actively portraying a private investigator for me and uh, he had received a lot of money and all of a sudden just disappeared uh, for a while. Uh, must have been more than about 10, 12 days. So I um, reached out to Michael Kubosh to see if he might be able to locate him. Uh, and what was the purpose of hiring Zach? To at first try to, to find out where Megan was after we first broke up. Where she was physically. Physically and, you know, yeah. Right. And thereafter? He had convinced me that he would be able to uh, at first talk to her. He said he was skilled in negotiation. He had been in the military for that interrogation, that kind of stuff, and that he would try to broker a, a meeting between the two of us where we could sit down and sort of 
talk about what had happened and why it had happened and, you know, give a, me a chance to try to, to reconcile a relationship. Did you ever, were you ever supposed to meet Zach at the Hotel Zaza? Yes. And uh, when was that? That had to be in um, sometime January, late January of 2017. All right. Did you, in fact, meet at the hotel? No. Uh, I went to the hotel, but I uh, sat outside per his instructions for several hours without ever hearing from him, so I went home. Okay. You've heard Laura Thurlow talk about uh, you basically watching uh, and following her movements and things of that fashion. Is that correct? I did hear that, yes. Sir? I did hear that, yes. And is, it was that her description about your activities uh, during that three-day period, was that basically accurate? It was not totally accurate, no. And what, what is accurate about her testimony? I did drop Laura off near the hotel. She said that she would go in and t try to talk, as she testified, uh, to Megan. Um, I had parked across the street um, waiting for Laura to come out. Um, we had gone back the next day again, as she testified to, but uh, it wasn't as if we were hanging around the hotel for hours at a time. Concerning the Z's, um, when did you first meet with him? I can't recall the exact date, but it was sometime in late January of last year. And there were phone calls that preceded your meeting with him, correct? Yes. And who placed those calls? He did. And why did he call you? To initiate a meeting concerning a discussion he wanted to have about a problem that I had. And what was the problem that you had? I had broken up, or my girlfriend and I had broken up, and she um, had sort of disappeared, and I didn't know where she was. I couldn't get in contact with her. I. Megan? Megan Vericus, yes. Were you with Valerie at the time? Um, no, not when I uh, first met with Aziz. All right. And after the phone call, you all arranged for a meeting where? We met at a restaurant over in the Galleria called Del Frisco's. All right. And uh, I believe you testified that that was uh, a meeting that lasted for an hour and a half, two hours? I didn't testify to how long that meeting lasted. It, All right. How long did it last? About 45 minutes. And what was the context of that meeting? Aziz, or Zach, however you want to refer to him from now on, Let's uh, going forward. Zach. Okay, Zach had um, obtained some preliminary information on um, Megan and on um, my family that he uh, sort of showed me. Um, he had extensive files on me and my family and, and stuff about Megan and Megan's family. And who initiated that effort on the part of Zach to get that information? During our initial conversation, he had asked me some names, my name, you know, full name, Megan's full name, my family's full name. Um, he took it upon himself. I don't know how he got the information. I think he's got a background in you know, computer science, and he did some Internet stuff. I, I don't know how he obtained the information. But he obtained information that confronted you at the time you had a visit, a, a meeting with him at the restaurant. Yeah, looking back, and from what I know now, it was to appear to be very credible 
as a private investigator. Credible or not credible? To be very credible. He was presenting himself as somebody who did their homework. All right. And did you ask him to do anything on your behalf? Yes, I asked him to find out where Megan was. All right. And did you pay him any money for that? Not that evening. I did not. Did you later pay him money for that? Yes, the next day. How much did you pay him? I believe it was $2,500 is what he asked for uh, initially. All right. Was he successful in finding out where Megan was? He portrayed that he was. I'm sorry? He portrayed that he was. And how did he portray that he was? He said that he knew where she was staying. Um, he said that uh, he knew, um, you know, about where she worked and, and whatnot, that he'd observed her uh, at work. Uh, you know, I had asked him if, um, you know, he had talked to her, and he said no. And what was the purpose of you wanting him to get to locate Megan? Initially, well, initially, I'm sorry. you want to restate it? I think you have Sure, to Judge. Uh, was he successful in locating Megan? He portrayed that he was. In hindsight, the answer is no. He was making everything up. Initially, I had asked him to find Megan. I was worried about her. She had no access to real money. And he found her, correct? He portrayed that he had found her. Was there any money that ever exchanged hands after that meeting between you and Megan? Not directly. How about indirectly? I had assumed there was through Aziz. And what did you give Aziz? What supports your assumption that he gave money to Megan? Ten thousand dollars in cash. When was that delivered? Sometime in February. How much time after the meeting at the restaurant? A couple of weeks. Two or three weeks. I don't remember exactly. Again, these meetings never actually occurred with Megan. He, he, he made me believe that they did. And so you heard testimony from Zach. I did. And you heard that he, in turn, spent the money you gave him. I did. And how much was that? He gave a quote, I think, around $9,980 $9, or thereabouts. But he, he took more. Else that you, I'm sorry. He took more than that. Is there anybody else that you know that, uh, that was aware of this meeting and the delivery of cash to, to Zach? Valerie McDaniel was. And Valerie was present? She was not present at the initial meeting, no. All right. How, how, does she, how did Valerie McDaniel know about this transfer of money to, uh, to Zach to find Megan? After Megan and I had separated, um, you know, uh, Megan and I didn't have a lot of friends here in Houston. We had a few friends. Um, in fact, Megan and I hung out with Valerie a, a lot, um, and I had called Valerie and told her we had broken up. I'm getting there. Okay. Um, Valerie was somebody I spoke to about what was going on in my life at that immediate time. I told her, you know, what was going on and that I was hiring a private investigator and whatnot. And now what was that? You were talking about Valerie. I was telling Valerie this stuff as a friend. At first, yeah, I was telling her what was going on. What was her reaction to the fact that you were trying to find Megan? At first, she was, you know, supported me on that. She what? She supported me initially on that. All right. How did that change? If it did. It did. It changed dramatically. Um,
Valerie had told me that she was waiting for. Right. Um, let me answer. Uh, I answer a different way. Um, okay. Tell me about. Uh, Any interaction with McDaniel, either yourself or through Zach? Ever any? Which McDaniel are you referring to? I'm sorry? Which McDaniel are you referring to? Mac McDaniel. I'm not aware of any interaction with myself with Mac McDaniel except what I've already described. The only thing that I'm aware of is at some point Aziz called. Um, did Aziz ever call anybody? Yes. Did, it, did he? Did he in fact call McDaniel? I believe so. Yes. All right. That was not in your presence. Did not happen in my presence. All right. Uh, are you guilty of solicitation of capital murder? Absolutely not. Of either McDaniel or Megan? Neither of them. I pass you for cross examination. From the state, please. Mr. Jacob, you like to be in control, don't you? That's not my opinion, it's somebody else's. Well, do you? Who doesn't like to be in control of their life? Let me talk to you about Megan. You told uh, your attorney on direct examination that you were desperate for Megan, right? I guess you can characterize it as that. Well, I didn't say that. You all said that. Did you agree with the statement that you were desperate for Megan? Yes. And that's because you were in love with Megan, right? Yes. And at the time that you all got into that fight, y'all had been in a relationship for a couple of years, correct? Yes. And she actually moved to Houston for you? Yes. And y'all were sharing an apartment? Yes. And the night of the fight, isn't it true that the fight wasn't about finances at all? I told you what it was about. Isn't it true that she was the breadwinner in the family? That's not entirely true. Okay, well, you'd agree with me that you worked for Methodist um, as a contract worker, and that ended in approximately March of 2016, correct? That's false. You disagree with that? Yes. So if I have a piece of paper terminating your contract with Methodist dated March of 2016, you disagree with that? I was paid until the end of May of 2016. So. We'll go with May for you, May 2016, and then the next time that you start bringing in employ any kind of money, you'd agree with me is when you start to work for Charge Financial, correct? No, that's not true. Did you start working for Charge Financial in October of 2017, of 2016? No. Well, a little later, maybe. November? November, December time. And Things were so bad with your finances that your mom actually gave you money to pay for things, didn't she? Yes. She helped you pay your child support? No. Your mom never paid your child support for you? She may have given checks to me to, to, to pay it, but I always paid it myself to my wife. The money was from your mom, though, wasn't it? It could be characterized as that, yes. Well, if it's your mother's money and she gives it to you to pay the child support, it's coming from your mom, correct? It could be considered more like family money. Family money. So was it family money when your mom pays your cell phone bill? She pays all of our cell phone bills. Is it family money when your mom helps you out when you need groceries? Yes. So when you were upset with Megan from taking money from the account, that's really kind of silly, right? Because she was the only one that was really putting money in the account, correct? No. She had a job at the time, right? Yes. She worked at the hotel, correct? Yes. She was the one who paid your rent. She wrote the checks for the rent, yes. She paid the rent from the money she made at the hotel, correct? Incorrect. She paid for your dog. She 
bought the dog. Actually, she never paid for the dog. She paid for your groceries. She went to the grocery store, yes. She paid for the groceries. If you mean she went to the store and used our debit card to buy the groceries, then that's correct, yes. Okay. And during the time that Megan lived down here in Houston, she was always employed, correct? That's not correct. And she was always bringing in money to your household, wasn't that's she? That's not correct. And would you agree with me that you all had many fights about the fact that she was frustrated that you didn't have a job? She could, you can characterize it as that, yes. That she was frustrated? Yes. And that she was frustrated that she felt like she was the one that was paying for everything, correct? Those were her opinions, yes. Okay. And she was frustrated because she felt like you were sitting home at the apartment all day and she was the one at work bringing home money, correct? If she wants to characterize it as that, yes. She expressed that to you, correct? A couple of times, yes. And that, that's one of the reasons why you guys would fight, right? Because she felt like the division of what you all were responsible for wasn't fair. That was her opinion. Okay. And she expressed that opinion to you? Sure. And so when she broke up with you that night, she left you after you put your hand on her face, didn't you? I never put my hand on her face. So when you talk, do you remember having a conversation with um, Officer Jack with the Houston Police Department? I had a conversation with someone from the Houston Police Department. I don't remember the exact name. And when you talked with that police officer with the Houston Police Department, did he actually call you to get a statement from you about what had occurred with the assault between you and Megan? I guess you could characterize it as a statement, yes. And did you give him a statement? I did. And do you recall telling him that the only thing that you did was put your hand over her mouth to keep her from screaming? I did say that, but I didn't say I put my hand on her mouth. You never said that you put her hand, your hand on her mouth. I didn't say I put it on her mouth. Okay, what did, you, what did you say? I said I put my hand over her mouth. In front of, I meant in front of like this. I never put my hand on physically on her face. Okay. So you disagree with the fact that you put her, when she says you put her hand, you put hands on her, you disagree with that? Absolutely. But you'd agree with me that after that night, just like you said, just like that, she was gone, right? Yes. And she didn't want anything to do with you after that, did she? I'm not particularly sure you could characterize it as that. Well. She ran to my mother's house to spend the night, and then she went to my family's house to stay with them. And that, that made you mad, didn't it? Not particularly. Didn't you express to your sister-in-law that you were pretty frustrated that she was housing your girlfriend? I don't recall when I, I did that. Were you mad that, um, did you ask your sister-in-law, you know, Leslie Jacob? Do you know who I Leslie do. Jacob is? I do. And did you ask Leslie Jacob to help assist you in trying to get Megan back? I did. And did you um, exchange a series of text messages um, with Leslie in an attempt to reconcile with Megan? I believe I did. And in one of those text messages, didn't you communicate to Leslie that if she wasn't going to fix this, that she needed to get Megan out of the house? I don't remember exactly what was written, but if you show me. Judge May approach, approach the witness. You may. I'm going to show you what I've marked as case exhibit number 75. This is an exchange of text messages, and I want you to read right here. Just, yeah, read it to yourself. We are not over. I said to yourself. Oh, sorry. Okay. Got it? Yeah. Here you go. Recall telling your sister in law um, that she needed to fix things between you and Megan? I don't recall exactly telling her that, but something similar, yes. And um, did you become upset that? They were keeping her at their home. Not particularly at first. Well, eventually did you become upset? 
I don't remember my exact mindset. Okay, well, do you recall saying if she won't even consider taking is, that? Is that evidence? It is not, Judge. So you're testifying from evidence? No, Judge, I'm just at, so Well, I'm happy to lay it off for State's Exhibit 75, tender to opposing counsel. I'm sorry, Mr. Horn. No objection, Your Honor. Thank you so much. State 75 is admitted. Continue, please. Thank you. Do you recall um, texting your sister-in-law, Leslie? If she won't consider taking me back, kick that bitch out and I will stay there. I'm family. <coughs> I don't recall exactly when I sent the text, but it sounds like something I would have sent. Okay. Because um, you, you were upset that they were taking care of your girlfriend, correct? I don't think I was upset they were taking care of my girlfriend, but I had moved out of my our, our apartment and I would have liked to have stayed at my brother and sister-in-law's house instead of a woman that hadn't, hadn't wanted nothing to do with me. And your brother actually didn't let you stay at his house, did he? No, Megan was staying there. At all? So after this fight, did you stay at Adam's house at I all? I didn't ask him to stay there after that. That was my question. Did you stay at Adam's house after this happened? Yes or no? No. Did you stay at your mom's house for an extended period of time after this happened, yes or no? Yeah. And during this time, like you said, you were desperate for Megan, right? You wanted to get back with her. I did. And you took a lot of things and you, you took a lot of steps in order to try and reconcile with her, didn't you? Absolutely. Um, now, during this time when you're so desperate for Megan, wouldn't you agree with me that you moved in with Valerie McDaniel just seven days after your fight with Megan? I don't think I moved in with her seven days after my fight with Megan. She let me stay there for a couple of nights on and off. Isn't it true that you all started having sex seven days after you and Megan broke up? I don't remember exactly how many days after it was. Well, do you recall communicating to Valerie Mc McDaniel at some point in your relationship? that you all had been sleeping together for 44 days straight. Do you remember sending her that text message? I don't remember sending her the exact number of days it was. Judge, at this time, State Offer State's Exhibit number 76. An exchange of text messages and I'll tender to opposing counsel for any objection. No objection. I, I take it we skipped several uh, purpose? Yes, Judge. Okay. It's admitted. Thank you. Let me ask you, do you recall back on March the 2nd of 2017 texting Valerie McDaniel saying, did you know that you have been laid 44 straight days in a row now? I don't recall the exact date or what I wrote, but it sounds like something I would have communicated to Valerie. And if that's correct, you'd agree with me that that would have put you sleeping with Valerie McDaniel just seven days after you and Megan broke up, correct? If the math is correct, yes. Okay. So... When you tell the members of this jury that you're heartsick over Megan, that's not really true, is it? Because it sure didn't take you long to move on, did it? Matters of the heart and how you feel are subject to the way you feel at a moment. I mean, you're asking me to, to get up here and say that I'm some womanizer? That's fine. You can characterize me as that. It doesn't make me guilty of solicitation of capital murder. I have no problem sitting here and saying that I slept with Valerie seven days after Megan and I broke up. But I'm not on trial for being a womanizer. I'm on trial for solicitation of capital murder. So you can assassinate my character all you want up here. It doesn't make me guilty of what you've charged me with. I appreciate that, Mr. Jacob. But my question was, um, isn't it true that just seven days after you and Megan broke up that you were sleeping with Valerie McDaniel? I think he answered. Absolutely. Okay. And so when... Laura Thurlow was testifying. Do you recall your lawyer asking her a lot of questions about your behavior at the time that you were having her help you with things? Yes. 
And you recall her characterizing your behavior as bizarre. Yes. Um, you mentioned that Valerie, when, when uh, your lawyer on direct examination asked you who Valerie McDaniel was, you mentioned that she was your girlfriend slash your common law wife, right? We could be characterized as common law married, yes. And it was important for you to be characterized as common law married when all of this went down, wasn't it? It's just a reality of what the situation was. Right. Would you agree with me that you had numerous conversations with your mother about the fact that it was really important that you and Valerie be considered common law married? You'd have to refresh my memory, but yes, I remember something like that. And do you remember call, telling your mother um, that she needs to make sure that your belongings stay over at Valerie's condo because when this trial comes up, you need to be able to say that you two are common law married? I don't believe it was a reference to the trial. I believe it was a reference to the fact that I was not on bond at the time and Valerie had bonded out before her death. And I wanted to be able to go live with my wife if I was given a bond. Well, didn't you say when she takes the fifth, I'll be able to say she'll be able to say we're common law married? Wasn't that your concern? Not particularly. I may have said that, but I was more concerned that if I got out on bond, I'd be able to go back to my home. Because that's the only place she had to go, right? It's where I would have wanted to have been. And when Mac McDaniel found out that you were actually staying over at Valerie's house, you knew he was upset about that, didn't you? Of course, I knew he was upset about that. He blamed me for their divorce. And when he found out that you were over there, you knew that he and Valerie came to an agreement that as long as Natalie was over there, you weren't supposed to be over there, were you? I was never made aware of an agreement between the two of them. So you didn't know that you weren't supposed to be there when Natalie was there? No, I did not. Valerie never told you that she was upset with Mac because he didn't want her daughter around you? Can you repeat the question again? Sure. Valerie never told you about the agreement that she had with Mac? Not that I knew of. Um, you mentioned that um, he, Mac was upset with you about the divorce. Is that right? That's my understanding, yes. I never spoke to him about it. And you know that if, if Valerie was in violation of some sort of agreement with Mac, that Natalie would have to go stay with Matt, correct? I'm not a family lawyer. I can't answer that question. Well, could you answer whether or not you were being allowed to stay there when Natalie was there? Did you know that? I assumed that I was allowed to stay there. I was living at the apartment. If Natalie was there and you weren't supposed to be there, you would have no place to go, right? You're asking me to give you a hypothetical answer to a hypothetical question. Well, didn't it frustrate you that Max didn't want you to stay at the apartment with Valerie? I could have cared less what Max thought. Didn't it frustrate you that Matt was making a big deal about this situation and you were going to have no place to go? I could have cared less what Max thought. And isn't it true that you started to egg Valerie on and feed her information about her ex-husband, didn't you? No. Do you recall in the recordings both at the Olive Garden and at Willowick, you calling Mac a piece of shit over and over and over. I do. Okay. Let's talk about the Olive Garden. First off, you mentioned early on direct examination that one of the things that you were concerned about out on the balcony was that you were scared when Javier showed you his gun. Is that right? That's true. You were fearful about that, right? Yes. And that's why you started talking about Guantanamo Bay with him. Yes. Okay, but isn't it true that over at the Olive Garden, you also talked about Guantanamo Bay? I don't remember exactly what So if on the recording, though, you're talking about Guantanamo Bay at the Olive Garden, you wouldn't have any reason to disagree with the recording, would you, Mr. Jacob? No. Okay. And um, you never saw Javier with a gun at the Olive Garden, did you? No. You weren't fearful of him at the Olive Garden, were you? Slightly. Well, you're in a public place, right? Yes. And, and it's your testimony that you were just meeting with a private investigator, right? He was described to me prior to our meeting as a Navy SEAL and somebody who was not to be messed with. 
And you went there to meet with him, didn't you? Yes. And before you met with him, you had a phone conversation with Zach, correct? I had several phone conversations with Mac prior to meeting with him. And in one of those phone conversations that we heard in court, you told Zach, is he going to take care of both problems, correct? I believe so. Both problems. I just answered your question. I believe so. Okay. And so you go to the Olive Garden and you meet with Javier and then you also have Zach and Valerie there, correct? The four of us were there, yes. Okay. And when you step outside and you begin speaking with Officer Duran, you'd agree with me that we hear you on the video ask him, are you a cop? I did. You were concerned whether or not he was a police officer, weren't you? Probably. Well, concerned enough to ask him the question, right? Yes. And while you're at Olive Garden, you mentioned that um, Valerie has a conversation with Javier, and you know you know nothing about what was said, right? No, I do not. I did not at the time. I know now. Well, you knew then too, didn't you? No. Well, because do you recall coming back to the table at the Olive Garden and Javier telling you? She wants her ex-husband dead? I don't really recall that. He may have said it, but I don't remember. You recall Javier saying to you, so she's decided that she wants her ex to be gone? I, I think he did say something to that effect, but he didn't use the word dead or killed. That was my question. Do you recall Javier saying, so she's decided that she wants her ex to be gone? I think if that's what you said, it said on the tape, and that's what it said. Okay. And then your response was, I got it. If you say so. And then when just a few sentences later, you're statement to Javier is, I can give you $2,500 a week for four weeks. That's probably the best and the easiest. Do you remember saying that, Mr. Jacob? Something to that effect, yes. So to tell the members of this jury that you didn't know what agreement Valerie and Javier had come up with, that's not exactly true, is it? I knew about the agreement for the money, of course. And what it was for, too. I just told you I didn't know what it was for. Well, do you recall the undercover officer trying to clarify what kind of car Matt drove? I do. And you clarified for him? I don't think I clarified for him. I think she did. You recall Valerie saying a Land Cruiser and Javier saying a Land Cruiser, and then you say, is that what type he's got? Well, I think that your question would then actually depict the situation where I didn't know what kind of car he drove. Were you clarifying what kind of car that Mac McDaniel drove? To myself, yes. Okay. And do you recall right after that, Javier saying a brand new Land Cruiser, carjack him, put a bullet in his head, throw him on the street, and make sure he's gone. Make sure he's dead for sure, and then park his truck in one of those apartment complexes. You know, one of those shitty apartment complexes. When can I get the first payment? You recall Javier saying that to you? Yeah, the Olive Garden? Yes, sir. If you said that's what he said on the tape, and that's what he said. That's what he said. And in direct response to that, you say, I can give you $2,500 a week for four weeks. That's probably the best and easiest. And that's right? the chronological order it happened in? Right. If you say it's the chronological, chronological order it happened in, then I have to say yes. Okay. So you're agreeing to give him $2,500 just after he tells you, I'm going to put a bullet in his head and throw him on the street. If that's what you say. Well, that's in the recording. It's not what I say. It's what Javier and you said, right? I guess. You kept saying on direct examination that you never used uh, the words hurt or asked for anybody to be killed, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, and you didn't want anyone to be kidnapped either, did you? No. You said that on direct examination. You said, I don't want anybody to be hurt. I don't. I never asked for anybody to be hurt or kidnapped, correct? True. But that's not true, right? Because you told Javier, snatch her, put her in a room, 
and tell her if she doesn't fucking leave, I'm going to kill her parents, right? If that's what you say, I said. Did you say it, Mr. Jacob? Sir. Did you say it? Yes, I guess if that's what the tape's saying. And when you say snatcher, that's kidnapping, right? If that's what you want to define it as. Well, how else would you define snatch? I don't know. I left it up to him how to do that stuff. That's certainly not her willing to go with you, right? We were just talking about stuff at the time. I left the discretion up to him how he wanted to handle the situation. I think that if you ask me what my mindset was, I was just having a conversation about possible scenarios. I wasn't giving him any directions. So when you're telling him snatch her and put her in a hotel room, you're not giving him any directions? I, I think I put it as, so what are you going to do? It was a question, actually, that I asked him. No, actually, the statement you made was snatch her, put her in a room, and if she doesn't fucking leave, tell her you're going to kill her parents. I think I posed it as a question to him. Does that sound like directions to you? If it's posed in a question, I don't think it's directions. What, what, what kind of question is that? I don't know. So you want to know if this private investigator could snatch her? I think we were just having a conversation. Um, did you not want anybody hurt when you said, inject her with potassium chloride, stop her heart, untraceable? I said that was a, something you could do. I didn't say that for him to do that. You'd agree with me that if you injected someone with potassium chloride and stopped their heart, that it would hurt them? Yes. It would kill them? Yes. You knew that as a doctor? Yes. Um, what, did you recall telling the undercover officer, if those options don't work, I don't give a fuck, then you've got to do what you got to do because my survival is more important? Yes. You said that, right? I did. And you meant that, didn't you? At the time, I don't know what I meant. Well, what you meant was that you were upset that Megan had, had filed assault family member charges against you, weren't you? Anybody would be upset about having a false police report filed against them. So is that a yes, Mr. Jacob? Were you upset? Of course I was. And were you a little bit frustrated that if that assault family member case stuck against you that you weren't going to be able to try and reinvent your medical career, correct? Yes. It was certainly a hindrance to that, wasn't it? Yep. And if you're convicted of assault family member and stalking a felony, you're not going to be able to practice medicine anymore, are you? Most likely not. And medicine's pretty important to you, isn't it? It is. And so the fact that you might not be able to try and reinvent your medical career was upsetting to you, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And, and that assault family member case was what stood between, in your mind, what stood between you and your medical license. It was a hindrance. It was a hindrance, right? And if that assault family member case went away, then you were all good, right? I don't know if I was all good, but it would certainly be better than having it. It certainly wouldn't be in the way of you being a doctor, right? If it wasn't, didn't exist, it's not going to be in the way of anything. And initially, you were upset when she obtained that protective order, too, weren't you? Which protective order are you talking about, the temporary one or the one we agreed to, the no contact order? The temporary one. Well, that came with the charges for assault and violence. And you were upset about that, weren't you? Well, of course I was upset about the, the uh, assault and violence charges to begin with. Um, you were concerned that it might be public record that um, you had been asked to stay away from her, weren't you? Now you're talking about something different. Well, let's talk about the two-year protective order. Were you concerned that it was made public? It was agreed upon that it would be sealed. And it wasn't, right? No, it was not. And you're frustrated about that, weren't you? Well, typically when you're told by the law that they're going to do something and they don't, it's frustrating. And you were frustrated, weren't you? Of course I was. Okay. And again, with a, with a two-year protective order in place, that affects your ability to get employment, doesn't it? 
I don't necessarily think it does or does not. I was already employed. You would agree with me that most employers probably are going to be a little bit cautious about hiring someone who has a two-year protective order in place on them, right? That's not for me to speculate. I already had a job. It didn't really concern me about my present employment. which is why I signed it voluntarily. Yeah, there, there was no, it, it wasn't a contested hearing, was it? No. No, in fact, um, you all scratched out that language and all came to an agreement that you'd stay away from Megan. It was you? a two-year joint no contact order, yes. Okay, and when you told Megan that you were frustrated that she got a protective order, which, which protective order were you talking about? Were you talking about the temporary one or the two-year one? I don't remember. But you sent her an email after one of them went in place telling her, did you really get a protective order, didn't you? You'd have to give me some dates and I could probably clarify that for you. Judge, may I approach? You may. Mr. Jacob, I'm going to show you what's been entered into evidence in State's Exhibit 49, if you'll take a look at that for me. This would be Thursday for the, the 29th of February. Um, I can't recall which one I was referring to. Okay, but you were mad about it. Well, I was asking a question, do you seriously get a protection order against me? And my question is, were you mad about it? I was, you know, a little upset. I was upset about it. You were upset that a lower middle class girl from Pittsburgh had brought charges against you, weren't you? It had nothing to do with where she was from. Well, you mentioned it several times to the undercover officer, didn't you? You're asking me two different questions. No, I'm not. I'm asking you, did you mention to the undercover officer that Megan was a lower middle class girl from Pittsburgh? That wasn't your question you asked me before. You asked me if I was upset that she ordered that characterization and she, she, she filed a protective order against me. So it's two questions. The first question was, was I upset that she had a protective order against me? The answer is yes. Her upbringing had nothing to do with that whatsoever. Her upbringing was an issue to you, wasn't it? No, it wasn't, actually. You felt like, how dare this lower, middle-class citizen bring charges against Dr. McDaniel, or Dr. Jacob? Not necessarily. I was more upset with her the fact that she lied to me about her education. She comes from a very, very nice family. That's not what you told the undercover officer, is it? I think I did at some point. I said that I like her family a lot. You also told uh, undercover officer, these are just lower class middle girls from Pittsburgh. You said that, right? About characterizing Megan and one of her friends. Correct. Right. Uh, let's talk about the last few phone conversations that you had with Officer Duran. May I approach Judge? Do you need, do you need his back? I'll just give it back to her. I'm going to show you what's been entered into evidence of state's exhibit number 22. Do you remember Officer Duran sending you this photograph? I remember him sending me something like that or similar. So at the time, it was your belief that Megan Veracross was somewhere zip tied, correct? Uh, yes. And it was your belief that your Megan Veracross was somewhere with duct tape wrapped around her mouth, right? Yes. And in seeing this picture, you'd agree with me that no time did you tell Officer Duran, whoop, time out, stop, this has gone too far, I don't want any part of this. You never said that, did you? Not those exact words, I did not. You didn't tell him stop? I tried to delay him. Mr. Jacob, my question is, did you tell Officer Duran Stop. No. Did you tell Officer Duran, 
I don't like where this is going. Not in those exact words. You didn't use those words, did you? No. No. Um, in fact, you are under the belief while you're talking to Officer Duran that Megan is somewhere in this city tied up, bound, duct taped, and you're having conversations with Officer Duran during that, right? Yes. And at this point, you also believe that Mac McDaniel is dead. Yes. You believe that Officer Duran has taken care of Mac McDaniel, don't you? That's what he told us, yes. He told you that at the Willowick apartment, right? Yes. And he told you that as you guys went out on the balcony, didn't he? Either the balcony, yes, somewhere in the apartment he told us about it. And Val after... Officer Duran tells you that he's taking care of Mac McDaniel. Valerie actually excuses herself and goes back inside the condo, doesn't she? Yes. And that's when you stay out on the patio with Officer Duran, correct? Yep. And this man that you're so afraid of, you offered him a beer when he came in, didn't you? Um, yeah, I think that, I don't remember which conversation it was, but yes, at some point we did have alcoholic drinks on the balcony. And this man that you're so afraid of, you actually offered to let him have sushi with you guys too, right? I, I think so, yes. And this man that you're so afraid of, you actually told him that you felt like you had become friends with him and you wanted to stay in contact with him so he should touch base with you in the future, right? I don't think it was out of so much comfort as I was... Do you want me to continue or... I'm not really sure I wanted to be friends with him. I, I really didn't know how to react uh, around him. Did you offer to help Officer Duran inject Megan with a syringe? I think I did. Did you offer to help Officer Duran inject Megan with potassium chloride? I think I did. Did you? I, yes. And you know as a doctor that potassium chloride will kill someone. Yes. And so by helping him inject Megan with potassium chloride, it would result in her death. That would be the logical conclusion. It would be the conclusion. Yes. There's an explanation why I offered One that. One second, Mr. Jacob. The night that you were arrested, you recall officers coming to the condo where you're staying with Valerie? Which arrest are you referring to? When Sergeant Quinn came to the condominium to do the arrest, do you recall when he came there that night? Yes. And do you recall walking into the living area of the condominium complex and being told that Mac had been killed in an apparent robbery? Yes. And when you learn that information, do you turn to Sergeant Quinn or any of the other officers there and go, you know what, I have information for you, you need to hear this. You say that to them? No. Do you feign surprise um, at the idea that Mac McDaniel is dead? I think I did. You did, right? Because that was part of the act that you all were putting on for the police that night, right? I wasn't really sure how to react. Well, you certainly had to be careful how you reacted because at that point you believed that you had paid an undercover officer money to kill Mac, right? No. And it was important for you not to let the officers know that you'd been involved in his death, right? No. You didn't tell the officers that you had paid Officer Duran $2,500 to take care of a problem, did you? I absolutely did not pay Officer Duran $2,500. You didn't tell officers that you paid Officer Duran $1,800, did you? No. You didn't volunteer that information to the officers that night, did you? No, I did not. Instead, when they ask you... Um, if you knew of any problems that Mac had, you said, I didn't even really know the guy. I think I met him once, right? I did. That's the truth. Okay. And they didn't ask me if I knew of any problems he had. They asked me if I knew the man. And what was your response? That I barely met him once or I met him once. Right. And you also let the officers know, look, we've been here all night. I did. And we've been watching movies here all day. I did. And so you'd agree with me that that's giving the officers an explanation as to your whereabouts and what you all had been doing that day, correct? They asked us if we had any information 
I said we've been at the apartment all day. You volunteered that to them, right? In a response to their question. And you also let them know that you've been there all day. I think we've established that, yes. Okay, and at no time during that did you say, officers, uh, I got to tell you something. This guy has my girlfriend tied up across town. Did you tell him that? We were arrested after the undercover officer had already told me he had shot Megan in the head twice. So why was I going to tell them something that I knew that was no longer relevant? At least that's what I was portrayed to me. So you felt like at that point, Megan was dead? I was told she was. And you believed she was? Absolutely. You don't think that was something you maybe should have shared with those officers that night? I'm not really sure what I should have done. I was in shock all around about what was happening. Judge, may I have a moment? Mm -hmm. Yes, you may. Briefly, please. Uh, Mr. Jacob, you needed an email to be sent from Megan to you, didn't you? I didn't need to have an email sent. You certainly wanted it, right? Yes. If you felt like it would make your criminal case go away, didn't you? Yes. And you asked, you let Officer Duran know that it was important to you that you get this email sent from Megan's phone to your phone, correct? Yes. And you let Officer Duran know what you needed that email to say so that you could give it to your lawyer, correct? Yes. And you had an elaborate plan that once that email was sent, you weren't going to open it, right? That would have violated a, const, uh, a, a uh, violation of the no contact order for myself. And you would then turn that over to your lawyer, correct? Yes. And then your belief was that your lawyer could then go to court and show that to the judge in charge of your assault family member case, correct? Sure. And so you were willing to go to all those links in order to get your assault family member case dismissed, weren't you? Sure. And you were willing to allow something to happen to Megan so that she wouldn't be present for your assault family member case, right? That's incorrect. Well, you said numerous times in the recordings, we heard it over and over, it's really important that she not be there for my hearing, correct? Yes. You told Officer Duran, I'm, as soon as she's gone, I'm going to expedite the fuck out of this. You told him that, right? Yes. And that's because if Megan's out of the picture, your assault family member case goes away. Yes, but still alive. You were okay with Megan being taken out of state for your survival, right? I never asked him to take her out of state. You didn't ask her to be taken out of state? I was told that's where she wanted to go. You, did you ask Officer Duran if you... If he could take her out of state, and Officer Duran's response to you was, I don't know, there's there's some issues with that. That that makes that could be kind of problematic. Do you remember that in the recording? I don't recall exactly what I said, but it could be something like that. Isn't that the end of the day, what this is all about is your survival? I mean, do you recall telling Officer Duran, my survival is more important than anything? I think I might have said that. You said that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes? I, I guess I did, yeah. Judge, I pass the witness. Good morning, Leon. Good morning. At the conclusion of yesterday, I was a little bit confused with some things, so I want to kind of go back a little bit and clarify. Okay. Now, <clears throat> you met Megan in Pittsburgh, is that correct? Yes. How did you end up in Pittsburgh? My uh, ex-wife and I moved there uh, for work. So you were kind of there going through your divorce? <clears throat> yes, there was a, 
I filed for divorce in Pennsylvania and my ex-wife had filed for divorce in Illinois. Um, and I was uh, told that I should stay in Pennsylvania during the um, jurisdictional hearings for the divorce. Okay. And we'd already given up our, our home, so I moved into a hotel. And what hotel was that? Originally, it was the Wyndham Grand, and then I moved into the Cambria Suites about five or six months later. And that's where you met Megan? Yes. She was working for the hotel? Yes. How long after you guys first met did you guys start your relationship? Was it love at first sight? Did you guys go on a first date? Yeah, there was an immediate attraction. I think that, you know, we were, I was living there and I became friends with some of the staff and we would, you know, go out and have. Uh, when you guys had your first date, was there a good spark? Yes. What was your relationship like with Megan in Pittsburgh? It was odd. How was it odd? Well, I was living at the hotel and she was an employee of the hotel, so we really couldn't commiserate or you know be around each other that much in the hotel. Um, also, she was married at the time, and so it was difficult to spend a lot of time to get her outside of the um, of, of her of work hours. So. you guys started dating and she was still married, did you end up moving back to Houston? Um, we moved back in to Houston in October of 2014, so... Um, did you guys move together? Yes, we drove down from Pittsburgh together. And when you were in Houston, how was the relationship then? Were you guys still happy? Yeah, it was wonderful. Did you guys start to fight a lot? You know, like any couple, we had our arguments, but as time went on, we had, you know, more and more arguments. What were most of those arguments about? Did Aunt Jane ask Yesterday on cross-examination, you referred to family money. Yeah. Can you explain what family money is? <clears throat> I mean, my family is pretty affluent. All of us are professionals. My sister's a surgeon. My brother's an engineer. My mom's a lawyer. Uh, I'm a doctor. We all have done, at times in our life, quite well for each other and or ourselves. And you know, we've all helped each other out during during times where somebody's had some issues and, and whatnot. And my so mom family. has family. done quite well for herself, and she is a very. So it's safe to say your family kind of looks after each other. Yes. Now, it was brought up also that <clears throat> Megan was considered the breadwinner of the family. It was. Were you bringing in any income? Yes. What would you do for that income? Um, I wrote, uh, well, I worked at the hospital for a while, and, and I had another job, and I also wrote research papers uh, for with Methodist and, and uh, individual pharmaceutical companies. So you were bringing in money, plus your family was helping you out. How did yes. Megan feel about you receiving money from your family? She resented it. speculation and relevance. I'll sustain on relevance. Is it an assessment that Megan had an issue with you taking money from your family? I'm going to object to leading. Sustain. What was Megan's opinion, from your personal knowledge, of you receiving money from your family? I'm going to object to relevance. What's the relevance of all of this? It's to show the relationship, Your Honor, going forward, that a lot of the fights that happened leading up to their breakup involved Megan attacking him for his financial disability or receiving money from the family. 
I think we've heard ample evidence about that subject, so unless there's something different, sustain the state's objection. Yes, sir. When did you and Megan break up? January 12th of last year. And that was after the assault, <coughs> alleged assault, correct? It was after the alleged assault, yes. And that case has since been dismissed? It has. Why did you reach out to Tom Thurlow? Tom Thurlow is an attorney here in town. Um, he's also my... Uh, or was my father's best friend, somebody that I trusted, um, someone I spent a lot of time with after my father had passed away. Uh, you could call him sort of like an uncle. So I didn't want to involve my mother in the legal aspect of... I didn't want to involve my mother in the... Uh, legal aspect of the assault family violence because of her relationship with Megan and obviously me. And so I, I went to somebody whom was a third party that I could ask some advice <coughs> from um, and feel comfortable with that advice. You mentioned Megan's relationship with your mother. Was she still close to your family at this time? She was very close with my family um, throughout our entire relationship. She was staying with my brother and my sister-in-law, evidently, right after we had broken up. So I'm not totally sure, or I can't answer to you how close they were, remained, but she felt comfortable enough to stay with my family for a couple of days after we separated. Okay, so <clears throat> you break up and you reach out to Tom. What was the purpose of going to Tom? I had received a phone call from an officer in the HPD, I think his name was by the officer Jack, um, asking for a statement about what occurred the night of February or January 12th. And he had told me that no files had been charged or had been, had been no charges had been filed. So when At that time, I got very concerned, and so I reached out to Tom Thurlow. After reaching out to Tom Thurlow, what did he do? He told me he would look into the situation. And did he? Yes. How did he help you with your situation? Well, I don't think you can characterize it as help. He, I think he researched what was being done from the you know, the HPD side. Did Tom Thurlow recommend you to go to anywhere else for help? He didn't so much as recommend me to go anywhere else. He called me and requested that I send some information via email to his niece, Laura Thurlow, who worked for him. And did you send an email to her? I did. Did she respond? She did. So what happened with Laura Thurlow? With regards to the email? Yeah, what happened after the email was sent? Did you guys meet up? No, she called me, um, I think, later that day and had given me some information uh, regarding whatever she found out. And what was that information? Jack, what you're saying. I'll rephrase, Your Honor. What did you discover <clears throat> after talking to Laura? That Megan had, in fact, made a complaint to the uh, Houston Police Department approximately six or seven days after uh, July, I mean, sorry, January 12th, and um, that at that time they were still investigating and deciding whether or not to file any charges. Uh, so the complaint was filed, but no charges were filed, correct? At that time, no. Did you and Laura ever come up with any kind of other scheme to go about verifying what happened? Yes. And what was your next plan? Ms. Thurlow had indicated to me 
that she had a friend on the, um, I think it was in Clear Lake or um, some other <laughs> precinct where HPD uh, was in charge and that she would reach out to him to see if they could sort of make the situation go away. And did she do that? I don't know. She told me that she did, but I can't confirm or deny that. But the assault still eventually got charged? Yes. So, you've been in here this whole time, and you've listened to the testimony of Laura Thurlow. I did. She talked a lot about these three options you gave her. I heard her say those, yes. What were those three options that she said? Option one was that she would contact Megan, talk to her, and, and you know try to figure out a way to renegotiate our, our, our relationship, rekindling. Uh, option two she talked about was uh, you know convincing Megan to go back to Pittsburgh. And option three, in her words here, were that they would get her in a car and sedate her and bring her somewhere so I could talk to her. And I don't know where she came up with that, but that was what she testified to. That wasn't you that offered the syringe? Absolutely not. When you first approached Laura, what did you explain to her about the situation? She asked me a bunch of personal questions about, you know, our relationship and, you know, how I met Megan, sort of like what you've done here. And um, up from the time we met to the time that we broke up and, and what occurred. So Laura had a pretty good grasp of your relationship and your opinion with Megan. She knew intimate details about our relationship, yes. So after you had that first meeting with Laura, she told you she was going to go to her guy, as she puts it, to help take care of these charges, and they eventually get charged. What happens? What else did you and Laura go forward and do? Well, the the charges, I wasn't aware of the charges until I got arrested. So in the meantime, yes, sir, I apologize. Yes, Your Honor. Before charges got filed and after you first met with Laura, what did you guys do next? Did you guys ever visit anywhere? Yes. Um, Ms. Thurlow and I, uh, well, she visited the hotel where Megan worked at. Um, Were you with her? I was, but I didn't go into the hotel. I was parked uh, across the street, I think. When Laura returned from the hotel into the car, did you learn anything? Yeah, I, I was told, or well, she told me that... I learned that... Yes, Your Honor. Did your plans change after she returned from the hotel? Yes, we went, we decided to, to take a break and regroup, and we went and had a bite to eat at a restaurant or a bar. Without saying what she said, did you guys discuss what happened in the hotel? Yes. Were you of the impression that she talked to Megan? No. So after you guys had a couple drinks at the bar, did you guys come back to like the next day or did you guys go back to the hotel? I don't remember exactly what we did right afterwards, but it had gotten quite late and she asked me to give her a ride back to her parents' house for a dinner. At any point in time during your conversations with Laura, did you mention that you wanted Megan hurt? Absolutely not. Did you ever reference to her being killed? No. <clears throat> did Megan, I'm sorry, did Laura continue to help you out or did she kind of disappear? At first she continued to help me out or, you know, she pretended to, I think, um, do a lot of stuff. But 
then she became less and less reliable, um, specifically, you know, leading up to when she introduced me to uh, Motaz, Aziz. So she introduced you to Motaz? Well, she, he called me on her request. I, she was present when he, she called me the first time. I could hear her voice in the background. So she gave Motaz your contact? Yes. You didn't reach out to him? I had no idea who he was. After that conversation, who did you believe Motaz was? I believed he was um, somebody who had uh, was a private investigator, essentially, and you know, ex-military guy who would come back stateside and sort of was working as his, his own, you know, for himself as a private investigator. In fact, Laura had told me that he had done some work for. Lots of a narrative. After he told you he was a private investigator, did you believe him? Yes. Did he ever quote you some kind of fee to help you out? During our initial conversation, no. But he informed you he was a private investigator. Did you approach him about helping you? We made a, uh, a time later that evening to meet at a restaurant. And where did you guys go to meet? Del Frisco's over at the Galleria. And that was the same day that he first contacted you? Yes, it was. I think it was. I, I'm almost, you know, I'm not almost, I can't be positive. It could have been. It was soon. It was close. It was within 24 hours, yes. You were of the impression that Megan wanted to go back to Pittsburgh. Why were you of that impression? This will be getting into things that were not covered yesterday, Your Honor. You may answer. Motaz Aziz had told me, or Zach. I'm happy to object to hearsay. Oh, I forgot. I apologize. Um, how do I answer that question? Um, what was stopping Megan from going back to Pittsburgh? Money. And you were told that by the private investigator you hired? Yes. Was there a suggestion made that you could offer her money to help get her out of town? It, it wasn't a payment as a bribe. It was to help cover the cost of moving out of town um, and to help give her some you know, cushion when she went back to Pittsburgh. So it wasn't like I was bribing anybody to go out of town, if that's what you're indicating. It was support. Was there ever any kind of plane tickets bought? I was showing receipts for a plane ticket, a one-way plane ticket back to Pittsburgh, yes. Were you allowed to keep that receipt? I don't remember. And how was he going to know that she got on that plane to go to Pittsburgh? I think she was scheduled to leave the same morning as the um, protection order hearing. Did he take any steps? Was he going to personally witness her get on that plane? I don't believe so. Did he ever come back and approach you and ask for more money? Not after that regarding Megan. I had already given him um, significant amounts of funds for, you know, what we had, well, at least he told me we had been arranged. Did you ever tell Motaz that you wanted Megan dead? No. Did Motaz ever speak with Matt McDaniel? Did Valerie ever have a private conversation with Motaz? Several. And do you know if those conversations were ever in regards to Mac? I believe that they were. Now, <clears throat> throughout the course of this trial and on Officer Duran's examination, we've played all the audio tapes. And you've got to listen to all those audio tapes. I have. <clears throat> 
At this time, I want to play through some of those clips of some of those audio tapes that I think we need to have you comment on. Okay. We'll start with <clears throat> the wiretap recording number one. This conversation happened March 7th, 2017. Is that your recollection? This is the very first conversation. I'm assuming that that's the right date, yeah. This is not the Olive Garden, Your Honor. This is going to be the phone call between uh, Motaz and Zach. I'm sorry, okay. Zach and Leon. Okay, I think I know what you're talking about, yeah. This is Officer Duran with the Houston Police Department, Major Fair Division Career Criminal Squad. Today's date is March 7, 2017. We are currently located at Chase Bank, located off of the Belt Bank of Westheimer. We're working with the high investigation, a uh, cooperating informant going to assist us in making uh, calls to suspect Leon Jacob. Uh, set up a meeting for him to meet up with uh, myself, Officer Duran who will be working in an undercover capacity. Prior to this conversation, did you and Motaz discuss having a third party come to help? Yes. Why did you need to have a third party come help? I was under the impression that it was necessary because of the closeness of the relationship that Motez had gotten to Valerie and I, and also the fact that he had been in contact several times with Megan and he felt uh, uncomfortable uh, continuing speaking to her after she didn't leave, per their agreement, as he told me that's what their agreement was. And <clears throat> were you under the impression this third party, what was your impression of who this third party was going to be? I really wasn't sure what he was. He was supposed to be, um, again, ex-military, Navy SEAL kind of guy who um, was also good at negotiating and interrogating. That was the whole shtick, if you will. I was told um, both of them were. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing, buddy? Hey, good. Hey, listen, I, I'm going to set up a meeting with you tomorrow so we can finish this, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, just get a meeting tomorrow? Yeah, I'll bring my schedule, no problem. Okay. And I'm going to bring with me the, the, the Navy SEAL guy because he wants, you know, so we, so we can get this done. I want to really finish so we can be good, okay? All right, we're going to go to a restaurant though, right? Now, <clears throat> at this time, have you ever spoken of a second problem? I sort of, I, Valerie had spoken to uh, Motez or Zach about... So Valerie spoke with Motez. Don't go into what she said. Yes. And you and Valerie also spoke. Yes. And she would have told you what was said to Motez. Yes. Where are you walking? What are they terrible problems? What problems? Both of the individuals we're talking about. Uh, okay. No, 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 you are. Um, so, <clears throat> what was your impression of what Valley wanted to happen at this time? Mm -hmm. So, sorry, what was your impression of what Valerie McDaniel wanted to have happen to Matt McDaniel at the time of this conversation? My impression was that she had requested that he'd be spoken to quite forcefully about leaving her alone regarding me and our living situation. Um, so she, I, I don't know what the details of what they discussed 
regarding what she wanted. I can't, I can't tell you that. I don't, I don't know. Okay. I wasn't oh. present for those conversations. And she was very vague when she told me what they spoke about. I understand. <clears throat> Oh, you mean batteries? Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I issue and batteries Okay. Uh, so it appears there that Motes was aware of batteries issue. I would suspect. Yeah, that calls for speculation. Uh, are they all going to be here? Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about it tomorrow. He'll take care of them. He'll take care of them? Yeah. Okay. Is battery one I thought Valerie wanted them to stop talking to her because he raped her. He told me that he went, she told me that Valerie doesn't want to talk, wants to talk to her, right? No. So Valerie's problem was to try and get Mac McDaniel to stop talking to her. Yes, he had been sending a lot of harassing emails and texts and calling incessantly. Okay, that's good. All right, just bring it with you tomorrow. Okay, yeah, but, but Megan will be taking care of you this week? Yeah. What was supposed to happen with Megan that week? She was supposed to go back to Pittsburgh as a maintained. Oh, for the, that was the plane ticket week? No, this happened after the plane ticket week. They, they were going to come up with some plan to... I guess coerce her or, or make her make good on the promise that she made that she was leaving. All right, good. We'll talk tomorrow, right? We'll talk tomorrow. I need my computer back. Okay, I'll get you, a, to get you the computer too. I mean, the computer I need back, like, ASAP, because I need. Unless the computer has some issue. There you are. We've heard all of this, so let's get to the meeting. Yes, Your Honor. So further along in that conversation. You start to discuss that you have court coming up in the morning. This is around timestamp 336. Yes, that's the job. Let's talk about it later, right? Right. We'll talk about it then. And so, what time do you want? Where do you want me? Uh, I, I told you, I'll tell you tomorrow, okay? Okay, so everything is going to be okay? Everything will be fine. Alright, because I need her to leave. And then things are okay. Okay. So, you just really need her to get out of Houston. And what would be okay by her leaving town? She wouldn't be testifying or involved in the assault and violence or stalking charges that I had, and they would be dropped. So after that conversation, you guys then, in fact, <clears throat> met up at Olive Garden, is that correct? Yes. I will now go to a couple of excerpts from the Olive Garden tape. I'm not going to play the entire thing in its entirety at all. But you were of the impression that the person you were meeting, the third party, was a Navy SEAL. Until he informed me that he was, I think he said he was a second petty officer mm -hmm. with the Army, I think is what he said. So while at Olive Garden, <coughs> the undercover officer asks you, what do you want to have happen? And this is the recording that happens afterwards. Oh, sweet. Do you, can you understand what you say there? I know the quality is a little bit rough. To be honest with you, I really can't. Wait, help listen to it one more time. Sure. I think I said I, want, I just want her to leave, I just want her to go. And what was, what was the undercover's officer response to that when he said, I just want her to leave? Does he agree? 
You'd have to play it for me. I, I you know, don't. There's a lot of stuff we've listened to. I'm not sure what everybody said exactly. <laughs> He says something like, uh-huh, or hmm, I, you know. So he understands what you're asking? Yes. So for that first agreement, you say, I just want her to leave. And he responds, uh-huh. Yes. And then shortly after that, you guys begin to discuss even farther into the details about what's going to happen. And then you say, I need to leave. Are you able to make out what you say there? I just want her to leave. After you say that to the undercover officer, you then try and figure out how he's going to assess it, and this conversation happens. Can you repeat the statement? Yeah, after you inform the officer that you just want her to leave, you then try and figure out what the step's going to be. Objection, lady. Sustained. <clears throat> While at the Olive Garden, you had this conversation following. What are you going to do? Uh, well, that's the problem. When you say leave, I'm not exactly sure what you want. I mean, what I've done in the past might not be what you want. What have you done in the past? I've, uh, I've hurt people. I don't want to get hurt. So I want to go. From listening to that, what is your idea of what you're requesting to have happen? For her to leave Houston, go back to Pittsburgh and not come back. And what do you mean by ever and not come back ever? I think it was a reactionary ever, you know, I didn't mean for her to stay there and never ever travel anywhere, but just to not come back and, I guess, bother me, if you will. So at that point, you were under the impression she wanted to go back to Pittsburgh, you wanted her to go. At that point, I was under sort of that kind of impression. I was under the impression that she had made an agreement with a private investigator to go back to Pittsburgh and had taken the money that I had well, given him to give to her and had reneged on that, that, that deal. Um, that was my impression at this time what was going on with her. So after you had that conversation, <clears throat> a couple minutes passed, you guys go back inside the Olive Garden and this transaction happens. I'm going to have to talk to you, Mr. Sack. This is a, a little different from what I thought. Uh, I get it. Um, you know, I'm going to have to talk to you, Mr. Sack. This is a little different from what I You offer up a different solution instead of getting her to go to Pittsburgh. Yeah, it was based on a solution that Motaz had suggested earlier. It was to get her in some kind of trouble here in Houston. And what was that plan? To plant some um, narcotics in her, the back of her car or something like that. This is, again came from Motez. Why did you offer up this second option? It was presented to me by Motez as an option um, prior to this meeting because why did you offer up a second option? I'm not really sure why I offered up a second option. I think we were just having a discussion about, you know, what could be done to stop her from testifying uh, against me. Throughout this conversation, if you can remember, were you of the impression that a, at this point in time, or Adam, the undercover officer, was listening to what you wanted? I was starting to get the sense that he wasn't, he, he presented himself as if he 
does one or a couple of things, and that's all. That's all he does. You know, when when I suggested I don't want her hurt, I just want her to go. And he says um, that he doesn't really do that sort of thing. It, it made me feel. Well, Let's listen to this audio clip one more time. I'm going to have to talk to you, Mr. Sack. This is a, a little bit different from what I thought. Um, I uh, what did you hear right now from the undercover officer? That he had to talk to Zach. It's a little bit different from what he thought. And prior to this, had you had a conversation with Adam? Not including what happened at Olive Garden, because this is still at Olive no, Garden. No, this is the first time I had ever met this individual. And a couple seconds later, this is it. I think that if you ever go, I don't know how you can do that, but you guys do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is it that you're requesting there? I don't know how you're going to get her to do that, but just to get her to go. And by go, what do you mean? To back to Pittsburgh. But prior to this, you had arranged other plans with Zach. Is that correct? Of what you wanted, other options that could happen? You mentioned earlier that you had other plans with Motaz. What were those plans again? If she wasn't going to go to Pittsburgh? I'm going to object to Austin answering. Sustained. We'll listen to this audio clip. I think you mentioned once about staging an accident. That was supposed to happen in the morning of the PO. It didn't happen. Was that accident supposed to kill Megan? No. He had he had suggested that um, that he would have one of his team members put some narcotics in the back of her car somehow, and that they would have like a you know at a stoplight have like a, a fender bent you know a little fender bearer bump cars you know and that. They would be forced to call the police, um, you know, to get a report made. And he, he indicated to me he had a very good friend on the police force that would come and then all of a sudden decide to search the car and that she would be, you know, detained. Um, again, this was, you know, Motaz's. Those conversations we just listened to, that all happened outside of the Olive Garden. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I guess they did. Do you recall who was all there outside the Olive Garden? At that instant? Yes, sir. I think it was just me and um, Adam. So now you guys go back inside, and this conversation happens. I know it's really hard to hear. I'm going to try and listen to it one more time. Please. Are you able to make out what, what they're saying? You got to play it again. It's very, very. Something about it's going to be hard to, to sell or I. I got the general gist. Let's listen to the beginning part just one more time to see if we can't all hear it and listen to it. This is right after you came back from outside. What had you and Adam just discussed outside? The options of getting her to move back to Pittsburgh or alternatively, you know, this fictitious. And what sort was your position on how to handle the situation? 
my position. Yeah, and how, what, what was going to happen with Megan? Well, I would want her to go back to Pittsburgh, but as far as how it was handled, I left it up to them. Would you characterize this conversation that we're going to listen to again one more time? Would you characterize that as Adam filling Zach in what they just talked about outside? Yes. And you left that conversation. What did you say constantly? I didn't want anybody hurt or harmed. And. Would that be hard for these two gentlemen to accomplish? Well, it was all a setup, so I think it would be impossible for them to hurt or harm anybody because this was all an act. But as far as selling me this idea of solicitating or solicitation of of murdering somebody, it was going to be difficult for them to do that because my intent always was for no one to be hurt. I'm going to object to narrative. <laughs> A couple of seconds after that hard to hear clip, I believe this one's also hard to hear. <coughs> Just try and listen. I can't really hear that one either. We'll move on. This happens a couple minutes later, and there is foul language. Can you make out what you said there? I can make out the word, the, the profanity, but... Let's try this to do it one more time. Something about if she doesn't fucking leave something, I, I don't know. I can't really hear the remainder of it. Well, why would you take an aggressive tone right there? I think that there was, or I, I know in my mindset there was an issue with control here during all of this. I kept on telling them I didn't want anybody hurt, and they kept on going back to the theme of killing people and um I don't object to narrative. I think he's answering the question. I felt a lot of pressure from them to sort of commit to this idea of killing people and that was never my intent. And so I think that I took a much more aggressive tone with them about what I wanted to sort of say, hey, you know, you've been paid to do a job and this is what I want you to do. And I, this, all this idea of killing and, and hurting people is not okay with me. And um, even with that tone that I took, the police officer continued to bring up killing. I'm going to object to narrative. Now, the state has said this quote quite often, and I'm going to repeat from the transcripts. What you do say is just put her in a fucking room, tell her if you don't fucking leave, I'm going to kill your parents. Did you want her parents dead? No. Were you asking them just to threaten people? Essentially, yes. Did you actually want any harm to come to anybody? No. Now, with this, you said you had a thing about control. You kept saying you didn't want people hurt, they wouldn't listen. What do you mean by fighting for that control? I was very adamant about the fact that I didn't want anybody hurt or, you know, killed. And they continued to bring up this idea of killing, 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 you know, people in it. I became very frustrated, and so I sort of, if you will, proverbially was flexing my muscles, saying, "Listen, I don't want that. You know, I, 
I don't know how else to describe it. You know, when you're telling somebody over and over again you want one thing to happen and they're being paid to do that and they're continually bringing up something else that's just unfathomable to me, it's, it's frustrating. So I think with the kind of personality I have, I was trying to be... Would you say that you like people to like you? Sure, who doesn't? Would you try and impress people? Absolutely. At this point in time, what was your opinion of Adam and Zach? Well, of Zach, I felt like he had been taking advantage of Valerie and I, and that. Um, Let me just stop you right there. What do you mean by, pardon me, taking advantage of y'all? How was he taking advantage? I felt like we paid him for a job and he, he, he'd arranged this stuff and then it didn't work out the way he thought it would and then he kept on promising that it, he was, he made promises to us over and over again, those promises, he would give us a deadline and then it would shift backwards and, you know, he said he had a bunch of other work he was doing and, and stuff at the same time on other jobs and I felt like he kept on pushing back what he was supposed to do for us. Um, and I'm going to stop right there. What was your opinion of Adam at this point? I was a little concerned that he was an animal, that all he wanted to do was kill people. Why did you get that impression? Because it's all he talked about. But then again, you know, Laura vouched for Zach, and Zach and I had become, we, we used to play pool and go out to eat. See. Yes, Judge. And we'll move on. And after a while, the conversation progresses. Eventually it is said something along the lines of, the undercover says, it might come to have to kill her. And you respond with something along the lines of, if it comes to that, I'll do it myself. I don't have that clip brought out, unfortunately. but. <clears throat> Were you serious in going to go forward and kill her yourself? No. In fact, you offer up this plan instead, right? <laughs> Are you able to make out what you offer up there? An injection of potassium chloride. So, would you have done that? Absolutely not. Um, I can tell you why I... That's why I stopped. Had the officers called you and said, hey, we have her, we need that injection, come on down, what would have happened? They actually did do that. Oh. Well, for the hypothetical, what would have happened? I wouldn't have come down there with anything. So why did you offer this up? Why did you say, I know a way of doing this? How do I answer this? Um, I felt it was a way to still be in control of the outcome of the situation. I became concerned that Adam was one-minded in what he wanted to do um, because I trusted Zach. I, you know, felt like Zach could sort of control the situation, but that. At the end of the day, you know, if it came down to it, I might have to control the situation and, and not allow them to hurt anybody. And how would you have controlled that situation? I'm not really sure, to be honest with you. And again, further into the conversation, after you guys have discussed killing her, you do say this. <laughs> What did you just say? You have to play it again. Can we escort her out of the city? Can we escort her out of the city? Is that correct? I believe it's state. But state, yeah. yeah. Why did you, why'd you offer that up now? You had already gone forward with the potassium chloride. Why do you want to now go to escorting her out of the state? At the end of the day, I didn't want any harm to come to her. I just wanted her to leave and go to Pittsburgh. 
So I thought, well, you know, maybe we could, or they could ensure that she left the state by, you know, going with her to make sure she left. Were you intimidated by Adam? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a military trained guy. I was, you know, the impression that he was a Navy SEAL and, and then I found out he was in interrogations and all this stuff. It's, you know, he's not a, he's not a, a big guy, but he's, he, he testified here. He put on some weight when he was, when I met him, he was much more muscular. Um, he also had a shaved head and a beard. Um, he looked, uh, yeah, he looked, he looked the part of, of, uh, of a mercenary. And the conversation progresses something along the lines of we can go here, it's going to be hard. I'm going to object to the waiting. It's just fine. And then this conversation happens. Are you able to make out what you say there? Me? Yes, sir. I, I don't think that'll happen. I think she'll leave. Or I don't think that has to happen. I think she'll leave. So you are still of the mindset that no harm has to come. Is that a fair assessment? I've always, or I was always of the mindset that no harm what had to come. What will happen? That she'll go back to Pittsburgh. After the Olive Garden conversation, You then go forward and have multiple conversations with Duran over the phone. We're going to now go to the recorded, the second recording from March the 8th, 2017. In the interest of time, I will be skipping. I apologize, Mark, that conversation is the one right before the Olive Garden. We'll be going to the third one. This is after the Olive Garden meeting. This is after the Olive Garden, yes, sir. about the minute 30 marker. And this is the conversation between you and Adam. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I can tell, obviously. Um, okay, we. I'll talk to uh, Zach. At, at least, uh, at least you start, I'll need the $2,500 payment. You get it done, you get the payment. Okay. Do you recall this conversation? Yes. Yes. Do you, do you remember the background of this conversation? So I don't have to play the entire context. Or I can just fill you in if that's okay with the court. Why don't you just give me the transcript? I can read through it quickly. Or just summarize it. I will summarize it. It's all right with the study. This is right after Mac McDaniel had abducted Valerie McDaniel's daughter. She wanted to give him back. And then you call the confidential informant to discuss what's going on. And then you tell them that statement we just heard. Okay, we, I'll talk to Zach at least. You start. I need the $2,500 payment. You respond. Just get it done. You'll get the payment. At that point in time, what are you offering that payment for? I'm not 100% sure what your question is I, regarding... I it, do you want this back? No, I got one. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, it's regarding whatever. Uh, well, it's regarding what Valerie. I think Valerie and and the con or Zach or no Adam had discussed um, as far as what should happen to um, Mac. 
but I'm not, you know, I wasn't privy to their conversation. But I, I, I honestly don't remember exactly what the payment was for. Did you and Valerie ever discuss what she wanted to have happen to Mac after the Olive Garden tape? Vaguely. Would you be surprised to know that she wanted her husband dead? Not at this time. I've heard the tapes. Um, she had spoken to me about her anger towards him and, and that desire earlier in time, but you know, I was vehemently opposed to anything like that. And Why were you opposed to that? I mean, from the sound of these tapes we've listened to, you hated the guy too. It still doesn't mean you take someone's life. Um, he's also the father of their daughter. And due to my own personal circumstances of losing my father at a young age and growing up like that, I'd never wish it on anybody else. In fact, your father died in front of you, didn't he? I was home alone with him, yes. Thank you. So, at this point in time, back to the conversation, and you offer that money, do you fully know what Valerie wanted that plan to be, or were you in agreement with that plan? Well, I couldn't be in agreement with something that I really didn't know what it was. And you mentioned earlier that you thought you could potentially control the situation still. Were you still trying to control it? I think I was always trying to control it. And later on in that same conversation with the undercover officer, I'm going to be jumping ahead to about the two-minute mark. Okay. Sounds good. I'll talk to you real soon. What are you saying there? Is it the two minute mark? It's at 208 to 218. Okay. Well, I, do you want to listen to it again? No, I, I have it right here in front of me. You know, I, again, I say I, I want her to go, and that you know I prefer her not to be hurt. In fact, you also say you prefer she just leaves. Is that correct? Yes. We're going to jump ahead now to the 440 mark. <coughs> Is this 440 to 507? <laughs> I didn't get to ask Valerie at the time because there was too many people, but I guess I could ask you, um, is there, is there, you know, when we've done this in the past, we people have requested messages or we've requested certain action, you know, some people want, some people want their target to get hit, you know, shot 10 times in the head or something, for personal reasons, do you want something? That's kind of freaky. What did you, what was your perception of that? Well, I kind of stuttered. Um, you know, no, I, I, I don't. Again, I, you know, I wasn't. Non-responsive. <laughs> Had the subject of sending a message ever been approached before? No. So this was a completely out of the blue statement made by this undercover officer. Yes. And your response, we'll listen to. Okay. So you're saying 
saying that whatever she said is fine with you, that they discussed about. Was it okay with you? It had to be. I, you know, I wasn't a privy to the conversation. You know, I, until I heard what they said on these tapes, I didn't know what, what had been said. And so, at the time, it, whatever she said was fine because I didn't know what she'd asked. Now, at this point in time, did you ever think that this was realistically an option of what was going to happen? An option, what option are you talking about? About killing either Megan or Mac McDaniel. Did you, did you take this officer as serious? No, I, I didn't. Why didn't you? <laughs> because I had repeatedly said that I didn't want anybody hurt. Um, I didn't just specifically keep that to, to Megan. You know, I had used uh, the word anybody. Um, I just, I never wanted anybody physically harmed. In fact, let's move on to the six-minute marker. I believe it's about 6.06. Again, it's conversations between you and the undercover officer. Yeah, it's fine as far as my screen goes. It's it. I prefer that no one is hurt next to our screen. I don't want my legal problem to go away. But, you know, you, 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 I told you what. That's it. You know, that's you know, you know, you know what I'm talking about. That's it. So you start off with saying, I prefer no one gets hurt. What did you mean by but you know I told you what. You know what I'm talking about. I don't remember exactly what I was referring to at the time. I just, I... Were you insinuating that he can kill her? No, I mean... I, was that what you wanted? Absolutely not. In fact, what did you say in that conversation? I just want her to leave my legal problems to go away. And you prefer that no one gets hurt? Yeah. And, and he wrote back to me, that's clear, Roger. Or, that's right. clear, Roger, I understand. Was the officer of the impression that you wanted nobody to get hurt? I'm going to object to speculation. I, I can't talk about it. I'm going to object to speculation. Consistent. Was the officer telling you that he understood? Yes, he clearly says that's that's clear. That's clear, Roger. I understand. Was it your impression that he understood? I'm going to object to speculation. I, I, I can't relevance. talk about it. When she objects, would you I apologize. Uh, sustain. So Max' complaint was a problem to you because of the alleged stalking and assault. And how were you going to fix that problem? If the stalking and this. Stalking and the alleged assault went away. Mac had no basis to complain about me and Valerie cohabitating. Moving on to the next audio recording. Yeah, I did. That's you and her as far as well. Yeah, I, I... I'm going to back it up a little bit just for clarity for the jury. I'm going to back up to about 148. Okay, I, I mean, I really prefer it to be two days from that payment, but that, that's fine. We can think of something. Pushing to get a payment. Um, what was that payment for? It was. I, it was part of the ten thousand dollars that he and Valerie agreed for. Whatever that at that time, 
my understanding was whatever they had agreed upon. But I had, I think, you know, indicated that we weren't going to give any more money at President until some stuff had been done. Um, but he, he wanted money that day. In your response to him, did you reveal that you knew what he was talking about? No, I said that they had the conversation, you know, that it was between her and him about what, it was no real implication about, um, let me look back here, hold on. It's between you and her. No, I don't reveal anything. You just know that they planned to deal with the male subject that night. That was their plan. But did you know what that plan was? No, I had no idea what the plan was. And had you have known the plan was to go forward and kill him, would you have agreed to it? Absolutely not. Because you had a difference of opinion, correct? <clears throat> Who had a difference of opinion? You did. With whom? With Valerie. We had had discussions earlier in time um, when she was just livid and she said, I want that you know, explicit, explicit of dead. And I had said, calls for hearsay. You had a difference of opinion? Yes, whenever it was impressed upon me that. Now non responsive. We're moving on to recording number six. This is going to be coming from March the 9th. I would rather talk in, in person. Uh, now, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'm just going to tell you then. Uh, the issue with the girl was a different, uh, a different deal. This is for the guy. Uh, and I have some good news for you, for you guys. Uh, with him, but I, I mean, I need something. You know, this I mean, this, this is business. That was for a different, a different, uh, a different thing, and I have nothing to do with that right now until I take care of the other problem. Uh, I mean, any, anything we have. So, what's happening here? He's asking for money um, there because it's business, uh, and well, he reveals he has good news for you guys with him. What is he referring to? Well, at that point, I he just said it revolving. Um, Is it fair to say he's m talking about Mac? The assumption can be made, yes. And he has good news. What was your opinion of what that meant? <clears throat> I really didn't have a, an opinion per se as far as... Um, you know, what it meant is... He just said we had good news. I, I had assumed at that point that you know, maybe they had spoken to him or, or that he had agreed to leave us alone. Um, you know, he, didn't, he didn't seem like he was too aggressive in his conversation with me. He wasn't like, you know, we, we got the SOB or anything. He just right. seemed like he had some good news. Well, moving on to about the 207 marker. You have various conversations about meeting in person. Meeting in person? And not on the phone, yeah. Uh, <coughs> I, I worry about meeting in person, so I worry about not meeting in person here too. But I, you know, I have to trust you guys. Why were you worried? I, 
I don't, I don't know. I, I was, I was wary. If I think back to it, I was wary about being in this guy's presence alone. Why? Because he scared me. Why? Just saying. Will this be the first time that you've met without Zach there? Yes. And at this point, what was your perception of Adam? Answer. Sustained. <clears throat> Were you worried that maybe Adam might come after you at this point? Objection leading and asked and answered. When he started about talking about, you know, I mean, this is business, you know, this is business kind of stuff. And he was pushing and pushing for the money when we had already agreed that we would pay Zach. Um, and then he would, you know, take care of paying um, Adam. And now all of a sudden he's pushing to get the money himself and he wants an in-person meeting. Um, I was certainly becoming a little concerned about um, being, you know, with, without Zach being present, if that's what you're asking. That is what I'm asking. So the rest of this conversation is setting up the payment. What, were you, what was your opinion of why you were paying him? Well, I, I knew that he'd come up with a number with Valerie and that, you know, we had agreed to pay him and he was very persistent about getting some money right then and there. And I certainly wasn't going to give him the, the, the full amount, but he had indicated that he had some expenses and that he needed some money. It was business, you know, and, and so... I was going to give him sort of an advance, if you will. Uh, originally, the money was always, always supposed to transpire through Adam. And at this point in the conversation, you didn't know what had happened to Mac? No. You didn't know what was sp supposed to happen to Mac? No. Let's go to tape number eight. Okay, I call you. Why were you worried about him signing anything? So, when Zach first started coming to our apartment, he was playing, well now I know he was playing the part of a, bless you, um, of a um, private investigator slash, you know, uh, ex-military intelligence guy. Well, I, I guess that is true, he was military intelligence, but he was always, I don't want to sign anything, you know, I, uh, where are the video recording cameras, that kind of stuff. He was very secretive about, you know, what he did. So I had assumed that um, Adam being his, now I know his long-term friend and partner, probably had the same concerns. So I was just sort of affording him the same things that we had always afforded to Zach. Every time Zach came to our apartment, even when it was just for a friendly dinner, we... So, so it was due to your relationship with Zach. You were helping out Adam, if you will. It wasn't helping him. I just assumed he wanted the same things that we Zach wanted as far as not being to, to sign in, which is why I agreed to meet him downstairs. You weren't worried about any kind of trace back to you? No. I mean, truth be told, there's the Willowick's got security cameras everywhere. Next question, please. <clears throat> the next one is going to be from the Willowick 
uh, audio tape. Is that Which number is, nine? That is not number nine. It's going to be a different transcription. Um, unfortunately for that one, I do not have timestamps for it. But I do have splices of it that I'll be playing. I can give you a transcript. That's fine. <clears throat> About 14 minutes in, this conversation happens. The metal subject, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. He's, he's gone. He's done. He's done. Do you remember what you said there? All right. Let's just do it one more time. It sounds to me like you say already. The metal subjects, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. He's, he's gone. He's done. He's done. Obviously, due to the quality, it's hard to understand. I did say already. Do you remember saying that? I, I just heard it on that tape, but I mean, this is over a year ago. I can't remember exactly what I said. Shortly after that, this is revealed. Uh, yeah, he was crying like a fucking bitch. But, you know, he's, he's done, he's dead, he's gone. No more of that. Now, why has your voice changed so much? It sounds like your voice has dropped quite a bit. I think I was in a bit of shock as to what I was hearing. He tells you that he's dead. He does. Why don't you offer up any kind of remorse or questions or anything? I'm not really sure what to say. You know, I I don't know how to answer that question. I. I It's shocking to hear that someone's dead, um, but again, you know, this guy's up there in, in the apartment with a, you know, a gun, and uh, I really didn't know what to say. And then right after you informed Mac has been taken care of, this happens. Um, I'll tell you right now. Like tomorrow, we'll get out of here down too. Okay. Okay, so you offer up what are we doing with the girl? What does he tell you? That she can, her situation can be taken care of by tomorrow. And what do you respond? I don't want to hurt. Let's listen to it one more time. I think it's what I said. Uh, I'll tell you right now. Like tomorrow, we'll get out of here down too. You don't have to hurt her. I don't want to hurt. Why are you still saying that? Well, he just told me he killed one person. And I think that I was still reeling from that. But, you know, I think it was obvious that he had a one-track mind about what he wanted to do with the whole situation, I was reiterating that that was not what my wishes were. You're playing one last time. <clears throat> and let's listen to this about 20 minutes in. Okay, so there's something else we can do. Which is where her body won't be found. But what are you going to do? If there's no body, how are they going to know anything? See, I'm, I'm trying to protect myself, too. I'm going to be honest with you now. I'm going to protect myself. What did the officer just say? He started off saying that, you know, if there's no body, there's no way to 
he comes back, he's got to protect himself. So, what do you take that to mean? That he was, you know, planning on killing her, I guess, if, if you're asking me what he, it sounds like he has a body, he's gotten rid of somebody. Let's listen to it one more time. Okay, so there's something else we can do, which is where her body won't be found. But what are they going to do? If there's no body, why are they going to know anything? See, I'm, I'm trying to protect myself, too. I'm going to be honest with you now. I'm going to protect myself. Okay. So, you offer up that you don't want her to be hurt. She doesn't have to be hurt. And what does the officer do? He's still talking about a, a body, and he's got to protect himself. So he wants to make a body disappear. For what reason again? To protect himself. This happens about a minute later. Well, actually, like 30 seconds later. I will do my best. I understand that you don't want her to hurt. I know that. I understand. I mean, you make that very clear. I, I talked it over with a friend, but I told her the same thing that I told you. I know you don't want her to hurt, but I cannot answer that. What's happening? The undercover officer is continuing to escalate the situation where he understands I don't want anybody hurt, but he's telling me over and over again that he, you know, wants to hurt her or that that's that's what he's gotta do, and I keep on telling him that's not what I want. And repeatedly throughout this conversation, that's how it goes. I say, I don't want him hurt. He says he understands, but then he says, I, have to, I may have to hurt her. And I say, I don't want that. And he says, well, you know, I understand that. But, I mean, this is a repeated theme throughout the narrative going back from the time I met him. Let's listen to it one more time. It, he even says it's clear. I'll do my best. I'm ask I'm Asked and answered and leading. And you are leading. Yes, sir. I'll move on. About 25 minutes into the conversation at the apartment complex, this is stated. What did you just say there? At all costs, I just wanted her to leave. I wanted her to pack her shit up and go home. Why'd you say that? Because that's what I wanted. I wanted her to leave and go to Pittsburgh. And what were you hoping to have happen by saying that? You mean, you have to clarify what you mean, what I wanted to happen. I mean, I mean why'd you say it? What did you hope to gain from saying that? That he would understand that that's what I wanted. That there was nothing else I wanted besides that. And then after that, the conversation progresses to this. You know, there's, uh, there might be another option. I was just, I was thinking about this a little while ago. You know where her family is in Philadelphia? What is it, Pittsburgh? You know where they're at, right? You have an address for them? Absolutely. What if I were to kill one of her family members and make her go back? What's that about? I mean, these are suggestions from him. I, I don't know if 
they are what they are and what he said. I, he suggested that what if I killed one of her family members and she had to go back? I mean, I certainly, uh, I don't think during this conversation suggested that he do that. But um, again, you know, he seems pretty intent on killing people. Do you recall how you responded to that? Just play it. Something in terms of I really like her family. <coughs> Was that an option you considered? Absolutely not. Um, I really didn't want any harm to come to anybody at all. Um, and um, I mean, the idea of hurting anybody was. Shortly after that, we go to here. You know what? You're, you're a good guy, man. You told me yesterday you're, I believe it because you have your thing too much. You need to take this, put this away. Which part? The very, the very last sentence. Do you, do you, could you hear what you said? Can you? Well, I was concentrating on when he was asking me to take one more. <clears throat> Let's put the whole thing in context. What is, what is happening here? What are they saying? Just play. He said, "I'm a good guy. I got to think with my my start thinking with my head and not my heart." Um, I think then he, when he asked me for another one, he asked to have another drink. Um, and uh, I, the last part, you have to play again. Well, let me stop right there, too. You said he asked you for another drink? You guys were drinking? Heavily, wow. yes. How much did you drink that night? That particular evening, um, I don't know how long he was there, but I think he had three or four... Um, ciders and uh, we were smoking and I, I had probably two or three mixed drinks. Were you drinking before his arrival? Took the day off. I think I had one drink at lunch. But yes, I mean, I, I had been drinking before he arrived. But I remember very specifically, we, he and I together had several drinks over a short period of time. Now, the last thing you said that we just listened to, I'll play it again for you. What did you say? Back it up again, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I 
She doesn't leave this time, you gotta do what you gotta do. Why'd you say that? I don't know. Um, well, what did you mean by it? I think I meant that he'd have to, you know, coerce her to go this time, you know, that he'd, he'd, he'd have to make her go. How was he gonna make her go? I don't know. I never gave him any suggestions. That was what he was sort of hired for. And then about 29 minutes in, after more discussion, more likely, and uh, uh, Max Mark is still more likely to be there, and that's it. I love her. I understand you prefer it. <coughs> what, what's going on? Again, he's continuing to push this issue of that she'll be dead, she'll be dead, she'll be dead. I want to, you know, we're going to have to kill her, and I don't know what else to say. I, every time he does that, I say, I prefer not. I don't want that. You know, the, well, the undercover officer is pushing this issue over and over and over again. And every time I say, I don't want that, but he keeps on recircling back to it. Did you believe him to be serious at this time? Yeah, I took him that he was being serious. He, he didn't ever stop discussing killing people. He even suggested killing her family, which I, you know, didn't want. Um, this was a constant theme with him over and over again from the time I met him. So why did you keep saying, I prefer no harm? Because I wanted him to be clear that that's what I wanted, that I didn't want anybody to be hurt. I don't know how to, how to say it any other way except for, you know, at some point it was like, you know, beating a, a dead horse. He kept on saying kill and I kept on saying no. Well, the rest of that conversation is this. I understand you prefer it up. And I, I can't give you a 100% guarantee. As long as you know that, because I don't want you to think that I lied to you. What do you say at the end there? She'll listen. You know, before that, he reiterates himself that he understands I don't want anybody hurt. And he continues to say he can't guarantee that. So you say she'll listen. What was Adam just trying to do? Or what was he saying to you? He was saying that he understands that I don't want her hurt, but that he can't guarantee that and that he doesn't want to lie to me. Say she'll listen. What was going through your head? That she would go back to Pittsburgh. So what were you wanting to accomplish by saying she'll listen? For him to understand there was no object to ask and answer. <laughs> A few minutes later. What's the plan? What's the plan? That he was going to snatch her and bring her somewhere. It was a question I was asking him. You were asking him. Let's listen to it one more time, if you don't mind. So you're going to snatch her and you're going to bring her somewhere. It's the plan. What was he going to do once he brought her somewhere? He's going to talk to her. Was the plan to kill her? No. Was the plan to cause her harm? No. A ways down in the tape, you make this statement. If you ever think 
your software, your mom can use me. Let me know. I want to read you again. I'm happy to hear She might need it. Your mom? Yeah. By mom, you're referring to Golda Jacob, correct? Yes. And she did testify? She did. What, what were you meaning by she could probably use the services? You know, I was just... His services would be, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, intimidation and interrogation type stuff. Why, why would Golda need him? I, I don't know. I, I'd look back on that comment. It's kind of ludicrous that I'd said something like that. So you weren't being serious? No, I mean, no. And then shortly after that, I've done things in my life that are supposed to be more than I imagined. But I couldn't do it myself because of the implications. What are you talking about? I think I'm just, at this point, I'm being very, you know, I'm trying to equal his sort of bravado and, and whatnot. I mean, he was scaring me a lot, and I. I'm not going to sit up here and say that uh, this is my proudest moment I've ever heard coming out of my mouth. I mean, I don't know what else to say to that. Well, what do you mean by trying to match his vibrato? The guy's sitting there talking about killing, 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 and, you know, I'm sitting there listening to this, and, you know, we're drinking, and I'm, you know, if you, I remember the conversation very well. If you listen to more of it, I'm clearly inebriated during most of this conversation, at the end part of it, and I was acting like an idiot. I don't know what else to say. You know, sometimes you do things when you've been drinking and it was an uncomfortable situation and I don't know how else to say it. Yeah, moving on to about 44 minutes into the conversation. But it's easier for me. I, for me, it's easier. It's just a straight bullet to the head. Easy messy. You probably have to do a lot more than I do. I do not have an operation. What, what is this all about? I, I think it's, you know, again, me being. It doesn't even make sense what I'm saying. You know, I do operations, but he's talking about bullets to the head. I, I, it was me being foolish and uh, bravado. I don't know how else to explain it. It sounds ridiculous now listening to it, you know, a year later. Um, it's embarrassing, actually. <clears throat> and a few minutes later... You know, I've always been of the idea that you know, dog eat dog world, man. She's fucking you old. You gotta do what you gotta do. what you said, right? Here's what I'm more important than hers, fuck. And that's the way we're trained. That's what's planted into our head. Of course, was. I understand that. What's going on? What happened there? Again, it, he's suggesting it's a doggy dog world. You know, you got to do what you got to do. You got to take care of her. And I reiterate, I don't want her hurt. Um, you know, he's pushing the issue of killing her. And then shortly after. I could use some of that stuff. What? What do you need the uh, injection? Calcium? Uh, whatever you need. You think I can do it myself? Yeah, it's easy. You got injected in the groin. In the groin, not in the heart? Oh, hell no. You can't have a needle mark. Why are you offering up and teaching? I, I don't know. Again, you know, I, it's foolish talk, but you know, he was he was asking, you know, you know, can I get some of that stuff? And, you know, I was 
sort of telling him how how to how you would do it if you if you wanted to. I mean, I I don't know how else to explain it. It was. Did you have the potassium chloride with you? Absolutely not. Where was it? Theoretically, it could have been gotten from Valerie's clinic or the hospital. I mean, it, it, again, it's not my proudest moment to hear myself say something so absurd. Were you planning on getting the potassium? No. Moving on to the ninth call, transcript number nine, audio tape nine. About 52 seconds in. Good evening, I need some uh, help. Yeah, yeah, did you, well, yeah, I, I sent you something. And uh, I sent you something. Did you receive? Yeah, we have a, uh, a location. It's a, it's a house. Uh, oh. At that time, what did you receive? It was a text message picture of uh, Megan duct taped around the, the mouth and... Um, <laughs> She had zip ties around her wrists, and she had zip ties, I think, around her ankles to a chair. Were you surprised? Um, the response was shit. I think, yes, I was quite surprised. by expertise? I inferred from the previous conversation that he was wanting me to come down there and, you know, inject her with potassium chloride. And did you have access to it? No, it's the middle of the night and I wouldn't have done it anyway. Okay. Uh, do you want me to take care of her myself? What does he mean by, do you want me to take care of her myself? I can only infer that he means kill her. And why, what did you respond? Do you have to do that? Why are you questioning him? Because I don't want it to happen. Uh, you should see how, how big is that. She's, uh, yeah, she's not very cooperative. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, if you're, I mean, if you catch all of that stuff, I'm just going to have to uh, put a bullet in her and hurt myself. What is his solution? His solution is that he's going to have to kill her herself if I can't show up. Was that your suggestion? Absolutely not. We're going to skip ahead just for the time's sake to about 2.40. Actually, about 223. Two what? 223. Okay. Now she was. Uh, now she can't do it anymore, but she was um, kicking and doing shit. Uh, if you want to show up, that's fine. If not, just let me know and I'll have to kill myself. I will. But I need an answer. Did you pay? What does he tell you? He tells me, yeah, she was, I mean, now she can't do it anymore, but she was kicking and doing shit. Um, if you want to show up, that's fine. If not, just let me know. And if I have to kill her myself, I will, but I need an answer. So he's asking for permission. <laughs> Yeah, he's asking for 
an answer. He's not really asking permission. He tells you what he's going to do to her. And how do you respond? Fuck. Well, I don't want her hurt. But if she's going to go to the cops, I, I mean, what if she, I think. Why were you worried about the cops? Well, he had brought it up earlier about, you know, covering his bases and getting herself and himself in trouble. But I, I think if you listen to the tape again, it's pretty obvious I'm under some distress about all of this. And we're going to jump ahead, just for time's sake, to about 3.45. Okay. And, I mean, in, in so many words, it was just something in line that I don't give a fuck anymore at this point. Not, you know, I'm willing to do what I need to do to make sure that this motherfucker doesn't get away with what he's done. Now the only, you know, like I said, the only problem with her, she's, you know, she was kicking, she was screaming, she was fighting. Of course she's crying, but I mean, at this point, I, I'm getting to the point where I don't want to deal with this too much. So if I put a bullet in her head and end her right now, I will, unless you want to come down and inject her, or you want to come talk to her. So you don't have access to that stuff right now. Why do you offer to go down there and talk to her? At that point, I think it's probably the only thing I can do to possibly try to save her life. He's become so adamant about that he's going to have to put a bullet in her head, that she's kicking and streaming, that she won't shut up. Um, Why were you so convinced he wanted to kill her? Well, that's what he kept on saying he was going to do. At this point, after I saw that picture, you know, I, I realized that this guy really didn't understand I didn't want anybody hurt. <laughs> and um, he was going to, his persona was going to do whatever he wanted to do, and he almost enjoyed this. So you thought you could save her life by talking to her? How? What would you have done? direct just a second ago that the reason why you went to Tom Thurlow and not your mom is because you didn't want to bother your mom. Is that right? I don't believe those are my words. Well, you said you didn't want to bother your mom, correct? That wasn't my complete statement. Okay. Did you go to your mom? I spoke to her briefly about it. And she didn't want to help you, did she? We had several conversations about it and she did not want to be involved because of her um, closeness to this situation. Well, that's not really true, right? The reason why she didn't want to be involved in this is because she thought that the way that you were behaving was stupid, in her words, correct? Judge, may I approach the witness? You may. I want to show you what's been entered in evidence of State's Exhibit Number 62. If you would, Mr. Jacob, take a look at this bottom mark for you. Okay. Okay, so you'd agree with me that the way that you were acting, your mom described it as stupid, correct? Is that right, Mr. Jacob? What are you referring to the way I was acting? Well, she, you ask your mother, hey, call me. I want this girl finished. You remember texting that to your mom? No, I don't, but I, you have, it right, you have it right there, so I have to say it happened. Well, you don't have to say anything. Let me show you what I've entered into evidence of State's Exhibit Number 62, if you'll take a look at that. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay. Your call, telling your mom, call me ASAP. I want this girl finished. Well, I texted it, yes. Okay. And do you recall your mom telling you, stop, this is all stupid? Sure. Do you recall texting your mom, look, I'm on the right track, I just want her to go, please put this bitch in her place. Do you remember telling, texting that to your mom? Yeah, I think we've had this discussion before. Right, and your mom's response was no. Correct? Sure. And so, actually, the real reason why you went to Tom Thurlow is because your mom would not help you, correct? That's incorrect. Um, you went to, your mom didn't help you, did she? She didn't have to. I went to Tom Thurlow. Did your mom help you? She did. Did your mom represent you, yes or no? She didn't want to represent me, no. Exactly. And let's talk now about, you talked about the fact that Megan had become a bother to you. You said, I didn't want her to bother me. Do you remember saying that on direct? I don't remember exactly what the context was. Okay. On direct examination, Matt asked you what you wanted of Megan, and you said, I wanted her to not bother me. Do you remember saying that? I recall something similar, yes. Okay. Because she was a bother to you, right? What are you referring to in bothering? Well, she had gotten charges of assault family member against you, correct? Correct. And she had a protective order against you, correct? There was a magistrate's protective order, yes. And a two-year protective order, correct? It's with a no-contact order. Was there a protective order in place, Mr. Jacobs? Yes. And was there also a stalking charge put in place against you? Yes. Okay. So that was bothersome to you, right? Yes. And Megan was the one that was responsible for putting all of those things in place, wasn't she? Yes. She was the one that went to the police about the original assault family member case, correct? Yes. She's the one that went to the two-year protective order hearing and got a protective order, correct? She got a no-contact order, but yes. And there was also a two-year protective order put in place as well, correct? There was also a two-year protective order put in place as well, wasn't there? To my knowledge, it was a no-contact order. Can I approach the witness, Judge? I'm going to show you what's been entered into evidence as State's Exhibit Number 16. If you could, for me, Mr. Jacob, read what that says right there, out loud for me. Agreed, right no here. contact, Where I'm pointing protective right order. Here. Thank you. Protective order, correct? The title of this document is Protective Order, correct? It's Agreed, No Contact, Protective Order. Okay. May I publish this? You may. Right here. I understand that. Uh, Mr. Jacob, wait for my question if you would. This word right here, do you see the word protective? You see that word? I, I read it, yeah, protective. And then this word right here, order. Order. So would you agree with me that right here it says protective order? In that one specific spot, yes, it does. Thank you, sir. You talked about the fact that you felt a lot of pressure by these people. That's what you said on direct, a lot of pressure. Do you remember saying that? Yes. Okay. But you would agree with me that after the Olive Garden meeting, you were actually the first person who initiated an additional call with Javier, weren't you? You actually called him that night, didn't you? I did. Right. So at no time in between the meeting at the Olive Garden and that, and that first initial call to Officer Duran, do you say, I'm out, do you? No. So you're not so scared and fearful of him that you're concerned about initiating contact with him, are you? No. You call him, right? I just answered that, yes. And the reason that you call him is because you want to make sure that he's going to take care of Mac. Isn't that right? Sure. In fact, your words to him are, I want this shit dealt with. Okay. In regards to Mac, correct? Correct. And when you tell the members of this jury that you didn't know what was going to happen to Mac, that, again, that's not exactly true, is it? Because you had the conversation with Officer Duran at Olive Garden, didn't you? Can you refresh my memory, please? You bet. Valerie stated, when talking about Max vehicle, a Land Cruiser. Undercover officer says, a Land Cruiser. You say, is that what he's got? And the Officer Duran says, a brand new Land Cruiser. Carjack him, put a bullet in his head, throw him on the street, make sure he's gone, make sure he's dead for sure, and then park his truck... Yeah. 
I'm not even going to object to her reading from the transcript. I think we're all in agreement that the audio tapes will speak for itself. She wants to play that particular clip. We're happy to listen to it. He asked that I refresh his memory, Judge. I'm simply refreshing his memory. Well, both sides don't agree as to what the transcription is. Then I agree that uh, is there a question as to whether or not it's accurate or not? At this time, I would say yes, Your Honor. Then use the court. Okay, Judge. For the record, I'm going to go to one hour, 36 minutes, and 21 seconds into the Olive Garden recording. She's decided that she wants she wants her ex to uh, to be in my dad gone. So it will be a charge of ten thousand. Uh, she brought up a good point to say it won't look so suspicious. It doesn't have to be all at once. Yes, I trust you, I trust you. But there will be a ten thousand dollar fee. It'll be um Robbery. She says she drives a new Ford, a Land Cruiser, a brand new Land Cruiser, uh, car jacking, put a bullet in his hand, throw him on the street, make sure he's gone, make sure he's dead for sure, and then some part of his trunk for one of the common cops, that's one of the shitty common cops. When can I expect the first payment? And Sad will probably take the money, or I can take the money. So, Mr. Jacob, did you hear um, Officer Duran say that Matt drives a brand new Land Cruiser and that he can carjack him, put a bullet in his head, and throw him on the street? Did you hear him say that? Yes. And then did you hear you respond with, I can give you $2,500 a week for four weeks. That's probably the best and easiest. Did you hear that? I did. And did you also hear Officer Duran turn to you and say, so she's decided that she wants... She wants her ex to be gone. Did you hear Officer Duran say that? I did. And did you hear you respond, I got it? I did. Um, this pressure that you felt from Officer Duran and Zach, would you agree with me that after the Olive Garden meeting, you actually exchanged 10 separate phone calls with Officer Duran, correct? I don't know the exact number. Well, we went through 12 phone calls, and if I told you two happened before Olive Garden and 10 happened after, would you agree with me that 10 happened after the Olive Garden? If math is still the same, yes. Okay. And so you had 10 telephone conversations with Officer Duran, correct? Yes. And a separate meeting with him at your Willowit condo, correct? Yes. And at the Willowit condo, when you're um, so afraid of him, you'd agree with me that you're the one that initiated contact with him when you walked up to him and felt him to make sure that he wasn't wearing a wire. You're the one that did that, right? I don't remember if I touched him or not. Did you go to see if he had a wire? I think I did. And did you make a gesture towards him to check on that? I might have. I don't remember. Could you hear in the video when we played it for the jury the other day, the ruffling, the sound of Officer Duran lifting up his shirt as you went to check him for a wire? Sure. You heard that? Sure. Okay. And while you're out on the Willowick, so fearful of Officer Duran, you'd agree that you had a pretty long meeting with him, didn't you? I mean, we had a lengthy meeting, yes. And at no time did you try and stop the meeting, did you? No. At no time did you try and say, look, I, you know what, this has gone too far. I don't like where this is headed. I don't want to do this anymore. Did you say anything like that? Not that I recall. Did you ever say to him when he said, um, I don't want her to be hurt? And what did you ever say when he responded with, look, I don't want this to come back on me. I can't guarantee that. Did you ever respond to that with, well, then let's stop right now? Did you ever say that? Not that I recall. Um, she needs to go. Sure. Would you agree with me that statements like that are pretty unequivocal? I'm not going to agree to anything when you take them out of context. Okay. So when you say things like, if she doesn't listen, what has to happen will happen, how many times in there do you tell Officer Duran, I don't want her hurt? How many times in that sentence do you say that? In that sentence, none. Okay. How many times do you tell Officer Duran don't hurt her when you say, if those options don't work, I don't give a fuck, then you got to do what you got to do? How many times do you say it there? I don't. Okay. You recall in the phone conversation, you gave him the address of how to get to your condo that night and then also provided him directions, didn't you? 
I do. You mentioned that you hired Zach to be a private investigator. Is that what you said? Yes. I um, mean, you'd never met him before this, had you? No. And you, um, your story to the jury is that you paid him $25,000 to help Megan relocate. Is that right? That wasn't my story to him, to the jury. Well, what did you pay him $25,000 for? I think you're mixing up my testimony with your expert forensics uh, banking testimony. How much money did you pay Zach? I paid him $2,500 to start, plus an additional $5,000 payment, which would make $7,500 total. I paid him an additional $5,000 plus for moving expenses for Megan, plus a first place first class plane ticket that he showed me a receipt for and I gave him an extra two hundred and something dollars on that so I gave him a thousand dollars for that and I gave him a ten thousand dollar payment in order to give to Megan so to answer your question correctly I gave him a total of seventy five hundred dollars to do the job that I hired him to do that's a lot of money isn't it some might think it is. Do you recall telling Officer Duran that the reason why you couldn't go through with this yourself is because of the implications? There was a lot of things I told Officer Duran. I may have said that. You don't remember saying that? You need to restate your question and put it into context. Do you recall telling Officer Duran, I couldn't do this myself because of the implications? If you say I said it, I'll have to take you at your word. If it's in the recording, you certainly wouldn't disagree with the recording, right? No. Do you recall when Officer Duran asked you, do you want me to take care of it? I guess earlier on redirect, your, your attorney asked you to listen to a portion of the audio where Officer Duran says, do you want me to take care of it myself? Do you remember him saying that? You'll have to refresh my memory on which, which uh, recording that is. On the, one of the phone conversations. When he I asked, know what you're referring to. We went through 10 of them. Okay. Do you recall, my question is, do you recall Officer Duran saying to you, do you want me to take care of it myself? And I'm telling you, out of the 10 phone conversations, I don't remember exactly where he said that or if he did. You don't recall whether or not he said that? If you can show me a transcript up hard, I would call it better. Mr. Jacob, if you would take a look at this for me. No problem. I'm assuming he starts... And I respond. Correct. Okay, do you want me to take care of it, her myself? Do you recall? Does that help refresh your memory? Yeah, it says it here. Okay. So Officer Duran asked you that question. Do you want me to take care of it myself? Do you remember that? I do. Well, now I do. And at the time when he's telling you that, do you believe that he's referencing killing Megan Barricus? I'm not 100% sure what he's referencing there. There's well, no he, context. When he asked you, do you want me to take care of it, uh, take care of her myself, do you recall responding, do you have to do that? It says it there, yes. Okay. Do you remember saying that? I just told you I did. Okay. You'd agree with me that you never said, no, no, I don't want you to do anything. Stop this. You didn't say anything like that, did you? No. Do you recall telling Officer Duran when thinking and believing that he has Megan Barakos bound, tied up with duct tape, etc.? Do you remember asking Officer Duran, do you think I should come talk to her? Do you remember saying that? I do. And, um, him responding to you, I don't know if talking to her is going to do much at this point. Something like that, yes. Do you remember saying something like, does she understand what's going to happen to her if she doesn't leave? I think I already answered the question with my attorney, but yes. Well, I'm asking you now. Does she understand what is going to happen to her if she doesn't leave? Do you remember saying that? I do. 
you told Officer Duran that you wanted him to send an email from Megan Barricus' phone to, to your email account, is that right? I wanted an email from her email account. I didn't care where it was sent from. Okay. And you gave him some instructions on what you wanted that email to say, didn't you? I believe we had uh, a discussion about sort of what it should say. Right. And Officer Duran, in order to send you an email according to what you wanted, you were going to have to give him some instructions about what the content needed to be, right? I think we vaguely had a conversation about that. It's not on tape, but we had a a conversation at some point about that. And what your plan was is you were going to take that email and take it to your lawyer at the time, Stacy Bond, for her to present to the court where your assault family member charge was pending, right? I testified before that I really wasn't sure what I was going to do with it, but that's vaguely sort of the, the gist, yes. Well, your plan was to send it to your to Stacy Bond, correct? Yes. And your plan was not to open it, right? Yes. To provide it to Stacy Bond and let her know that Megan had sent you an email, right? Yes. And that she in turn would provide that to the court, correct? I don't know what she would have done with it. I'm not a lawyer. Well, you certainly hope that that email would go a long way in getting your case dismissed on that assault family member, right? I don't know if I'd hoped it go a long way. I just thought it might make a difference. It might help it get dismissed? Yes. So. Your hope was that maybe Stacy Bond would present that email to the court and it would help your case go away, right? I think you've already asked that question. You've already asked that question. Okay. And you'd agree with me that if she presented that email to the court, that that would be false evidence, right? Sure. I'm not a lawyer, but yeah, it sounds like it'd be false evidence. Right, because Megan didn't write that email. Did she? I don't believe so. That wasn't part of the plan, was it? What plan are you referring to? Having Javier send an email to your email address from Megan. What do you mean it wasn't part of the plan? We had a discussion about it. Mr. Jacob, my question to you is, did you want Officer Duran to send you an email? Yes or no? Yes. You mentioned at the end of your testimony that you were a roller coaster of emotions when Sergeant Quinn came to your condo that night. Is that fair? That's a fair assessment. And we had an opportunity to view uh, Valerie on that video go back in the back hallway and retrieve you. Is that correct? You did not see her retrieve me. She just went back in the hallway and I came out some time later. So it's fair to assume that she went and got you and brought you back out, right? Yes. And. Your lawyer on a directive, you mentioned that Valerie went to get you because you were sleeping, right? That was the assumption, yes. Were you sleeping? I don't believe so. Well, you don't believe so or you weren't? I wasn't. And so she went to get you and we see on video you come out, correct? I did. And you would agree with me that no time on that video um, do we see you cry at all, right? That's true. There's the only emotion that we see coming from you is shock at the fact that you're being arrested, right? You can characterize it any way you wish. Well, you were certainly surprised, weren't you? Yes. Can I pass the witness? Briefly, Your Honor. <clears throat> the state referred to a text message conversation between you and your mom, Golda in which she said that you were acting stupid. I believe I referred to a quote where you said you wanted Megan finished, and then you said, put this bitch in her place. This is shortly after you broke up, is that fair? Yeah. Were you angry? Yeah, I was upset and angry, and I was talking to my mother. Emotions were high? Sure. You said something stupid? Absolutely. Sustained. Were you, did, were you saying stupid things to your mother? Absolutely. Now, <clears throat> we just had that protective order published. Uh, do you still have a copy of that screen, please? If I may publish it, Your Honor. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I know it says protective order here, but what does it say right here, Leon? Agreed, no contact. 
And is it signed by two people? It is. One's your attorney, Stacy Bond. It's actually four people. One of them's your attorney, Stacy Bond. Yes. One's Beth Barron, the assistant district attorney. Yes. And you know what this is? It appears to be a uh, stamp from the district clerk of Harris County's office. Cer here? Certified document number. And so the certified document that was entered into the state that has agreed no contact on it, and then protective order. So it is an no, agreed no contact order, is that not correct? Yes. And that's, and what, what did that say again? Certified document number. Now, <clears throat> at the Olive Garden, what had that told you already about Officer Duran before the Olive Garden meeting? I've got to ask and answer. I don't understand the question. The question is going to get into the fact. No, I don't understand your question. Okay. I mean, it's awfully broad. What are you telling me about somebody? Can you give me what you're saying? Yes, I can, Your Honor. Thank you. Prior to the Olive Garden meeting, what did Zach tell you about Javier's expertise? Objection, ask and answer. Sustained. Did you have fear of Javier grow throughout the relationship? Objection, asked and answered. Sustained. When Javier came over to the Willowick apartment, was he armed? He was. He had a gun on his pit, you know? Objection, leading. He was in his and hands. I'm oh, sorry. Objection, asked and answered, and leading. Sustained. Can you remember the last time you have cried, Leon? Objection, relevant. Just 